Well, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to all of you around the world. And welcome to our digital forum, Food Without Farmers. Uh, my name is Conrad Hartfleisch, and I will be the host for the next few hours. And we will be talking about organic agriculture. We'll also be looking at how we envision the future of food and the role that farmers will play in it. And throughout the event, we'll be using a number of interactive tools, and uh, this is how you can also participate. We want you to be part of this process. We're sitting um, thousands of kilometers apart around the globe, but we are still connected. So if you are tweeting, please use hashtag eathonest or and hashtag thinklandscapes. And then we also have Slido, hashtag glf-ifarm. And here we'll ask questions. We will be able to view your questions and we will use a number of tools to keep sharing thoughts and also getting your ideas. And our first two activities are, once you are in Slido, you will see that there are different rooms. And in room one, we have, what is organic agriculture? And we will have two questions there at the moment, trying to build a word cloud. What are you in mind when you think about organic agriculture? Post it and help us build an idea of what you're thinking about organic agriculture. And then we will also do a little poll, uh, checking on a scale from 1 to 10 how often you buy organic produce, 1 being never, 10 being always, and comment why or why you don't. So as we go through the program, we'll come back to Slido from time to time and, uh, and check in with you. But now, without any further ado, I would like to kick off the day by handing over to Louise Lutikolt the Executive Director of IFOM Organics International, and she will be giving us a short introduction to our organization, what we do, why we do it, and why we are collaborating with GLF on this event. Uh, so over to you, Louise. Thank you, Conrad, and thank you for the introduction. So um, IFOM Organics International is the global organic agent of change for true sustainability in agriculture, value chains and consumption in line with the principles of organic agriculture and so we are an association and we work with and also on behalf of our 800 affiliates in about 120 countries worldwide so all these organizations have in common that they fully subscribe to the principles of organic agriculture the principles of health ecology fairness and care and we want that more farmers practice organic agriculture or similar approaches like agroecology, and that more consumers have the opportunity to eat nutritious, healthy, organic food. And we also want that organic agriculture even gets better and so can contribute to the sustainable development goals and to our common goods. And we're doing so, we want to inspire those farmers that are not, are not yet organic and so that they can become also more sustainable by integrating practices and methods that are uh, coming from organic agriculture. And uh, we do so by providing capacity and leadership development, by accurate communication and campaigning to multipliers, like for instance, our Honest Food campaign. And also very important is that we advocate and we provide competence for a favorable policy environment for organic agriculture. Such policy environment should actually include the true societal costs of what we call public bats, which are the externalities of chemical industrial agriculture. And so at this occasion, we're very happy to work with the Global Landscapes Forum. The current theme on food and livelihoods directly relates uh, with our work to promote organic agriculture. We know from experience and studies that practicing agroecological and organic agriculture positively contributes to the livelihood of farmers and the majority of them being smallholders. And perhaps it's not a strange thought to also think about the livelihood of landscapes, or maybe even I should say foodscapes. Because as long as we know people have related to their natural environment, they are part of it actually, and they need it for their survival. And many landscapes have functions as foodscapes for exactly this purpose. Um, but unfortunately, we are on a dangerous path right now 
by no longer respecting the interrelation between the livelihood of both humans and landscapes. So the Global Landscape Forum therefore rightly puts the focus on how to survive in the Anthropocene. And we from IFAM Organics International are convinced that such survival is possible only in relation and interrelation to our agroecological landscapes and by respecting planetary boundaries. Back to you, Conrad. Thanks, Louise. Thanks for the uh, introduction uh, to what we do, why we do it. And um, uh, we will hear from Louisa again later today. Uh, she will be part of our panel and she will also reintroduce us much later in the program. We have a lot of things happening. Uh, there's a lot of technicalities around here. This is a, yeah, it's a major event for us. And I'm, I'm really excited that we are using all these tools now interactively. So I would like to go and see what's happening on Slido, uh, see what you have done, what you have said so far, and we'll click through and, uh, and see what is on Slido. Please do that. And uh, if you're not on Slido and you're out somewhere else, tweet. There we go. We have uh, uh, Slido up, and we look at the, the words that are coming to mind, the word cloud, sustainable being massive and central to it. Very good to see that, sustainability. Health, friendliness, free. Um, wonder what is free? Is organic agriculture free and should it be free? Chemical, soil, sustainability, great. Yeah, so we're starting to get a feeling of, of, of people's view on this. Uh, we also asked you to, um, to have a look and tell us whether you buy organic and why and why not. It usually takes a bit of time to, to pop up um, on a scale of one to 10, there we go. So on the scale of one to 10, um, one being never, 10 being always, it's all on the positive side. So we are preaching to a lot of people in the choir at the moment, that's great. Ah, there's some, uh, uh, it's starting to uh, move and change. So. Uh, eight being quite high, 31% of our respondents at the moment. Good. We are moving. You guys are there. I'm really good to see that. And uh, keep on posting. Slido will change every now and then. We'll bring you questions in. And now as we uh, go to our first panelists, um, we will also post questions over there. But before we get there, Let's dive into some content. We'll get things going by looking at the principles of organic agriculture, namely health, ecology, fairness, and care. These four principles were posted and adopted by um, the organic movement well, a decade ago. And uh, we put together a video showing how organic farming can provide good food for all, be a solution to challenges such as biodiversity, uh, loss and climate change and throughout the video we will ask you to tell us what you know about organic if you buy it And share more questions that you might have for the panel after the video Please give your name and your location when you ask a question at around about 1345 We will start a live Q&A with our board members of organic international and uh, Translation will be done in French and Spanish Okay, so with that I would like to move over to the video. Our vision is the worldwide adoption of ecologically, socially, and economically sound systems based on the principles of organic agriculture. Health, ecology, fairness, and care. This means growing food in a way that sustains the health of people and the planet. That nourishes living ecological systems and cycles. That builds relationships, ensuring fairness both among people and in their relations to other living beings. And also protects and cares for the health and well-being of current and future generations as well as the environment. Soil, a solution to climate change? 
Day after day, we are pumping more and more carbon dioxide into the air and heating up our planet. Industrial agriculture is making things worse. Luckily, we have a solution to help cool things down, and it's right under our feet. It's the soil. Soil is our secret weapon in the battle against climate change. It absorbs huge amounts of carbon from all around us. In fact, it already stores three times as much as the atmosphere and five times as much as forests. Managed in harmony with nature, it has the potential to store much more. By using methods which are essential elements of organic farming, such as cover cropping, composting and crop rotations, farmers can enhance soil carbon sequestration. Soils managed in such a way can retain significantly more carbon than industrial monocropping systems. There are a lot of ways to increase soil organic carbon levels. Longer grazing periods and pasture management, hedges at field boundaries, agroforestry and restoring land in poor conditions. Besides cutting down on greenhouse gas emissions, using management practices that increase the quantity of carbon stored in the soils, we can slow down or even stop global warming. What's more, by not using harmful synthetic fertilizers and pesticides, organic agriculture keeps you and our planet healthy. Healthy soils equals healthy food, healthy people, and a healthy planet. You are waiting for the rain now? Also. Yeah, we are waiting for the yes. rain. <laughs> That's why you see now it is uh, yeah. withering. Yes. Yes. You can't see good green. We're experiencing a lot of drought in Kenya. Last year the rains failed. We didn't get the long rains in August. The September short rains failed completely. So because of that, the, um, we don't have a lot of food in Kenya. But on our farm, I, I, I need to be honest to say that uh, we have been affected to an extent. But what we, have, uh, we still have some produce to sell. And how this has been possible is because uh, we have good soils. When I started doing organic farming, my type of soil has changed. I can keep more water than my neighbors. Uh, the soil stores more water, so I have more season, or rather longer season than my neighbors. Yeah. Sweet potatoes actually do well, you know, in, you know, with little water. And I decided to just plant this and um, you'll be amazed that for this little space, if we're to harvest all of this, we'll get even sometimes more than 50 kilos, just in a very small area. Yeah, they're very drought resistant. And I hope with time, like our government or policy makers will be able to take us back to drought resistant crops because the climate changes. It's getting to us. Dear friends, today I would like to share with you my understanding on the principle of house of organic agriculture. When people talk about the house, they are usually regarding to the house of human beings. Yes, of course, the house of human beings is our aim. It's so important. But the house of human beings comes from the healthy soil, healthy plants, healthy animals, healthy environment, healthy ecosystem, healthy nature, and a healthy earth. Even only regard to the health of human beings, there are two parts. Consumers 
and farmers. They cannot be separated. They are in one family. This is a win-win system, because when the consumers they pay more for the organic products for the organic food, yes, they are benefiting themselves for their health. But of course, they are also benefiting the nature, the animals, the plants, the soils, and exactly they are benefiting the farmers for their health. You see. The farmers, when they apply chemicals in their fields, the chemicals, the contamination they get is hundreds and thousands times more than what the consumers they take from the residues of their food. So, the farmers they are producing. Products for the consumers, but actually they are benefiting themselves. There is something say saying one family two systems. That means some some of the farmers they only apply chemicals in the fields that are supplying products of food to the consumers, and they keep their own part small part of field without chemicals. They think they are protecting their, themselves, but actually, when they are applying chemicals in the large portion of their fields, they are still contaminated. So, there is no single winning part. This is a win-win system. We have to work together to make a sustainable, healthy Earth. To protect, it, finally, to protect the health of the human beings. Thank you very much. Let me tell you a story, a story about birds. In fact, let's look at one bird, the barn swallow. You may know it. It's the one that builds its nest under the roofs of village houses, farmhouses, and barns. Bird populations, such as swallows, give us a good indication of how well our environment is doing. And how is it doing? Well, the fact is, it's not doing so great. Bird life is in decline. Industrial agriculture is changing our landscape and killing insect life, an essential food source for birds. And this helps explain the 30% reduction in the swallow population over the last decade. As we speak, Spain is losing about 500,000 swallows each year. But we can change this by choosing to buy more organically grown food and supporting farmers who farm in a biodiversity-friendly and sustainable way. Agroecological practices such as organic offer a wide range of pest control solutions. It's not just pulling the pesticide trigger. This is why organic farms are teeming with wildlife and offer birds both nourishment and a place to nest. In return, birds can help farmers control pests naturally. Love nature. Choose local, seasonal, and organic. Con la cooperativa Agricola Coraggio abbiamo da subito fatto la scelta di, di coltivare con metodo biologico. E si utilizza questo metodo innanzitutto per un atteggiamento di, di prudenza nei confronti di un sistema di cose molto complesso, eh, dove quindi l'uomo deve entrare in punta di piedi. Utilizzare un sistema biologico significa valorizzare al meglio le risorse che si trovano già in campo, innanzitutto. Non apportare fonti di energia da, dall'esterno, non intervenire in modo aggressivo eh, per il controllo degli amparassiti、eh, piuttosto che delle erbe spontanee, ma cercare di far convivere tutti i sistemi,、eh, diciamo tutti gli elementi、eh, di un sistema complesso come quello agricolo insieme, cercando di far sì che si valorizzino a vicenda. Per questo non utilizziamo concimi di sintesi, 
non utilizziamo veleni che altrimenti poi finirebbe che mangeremmo come pesticidi e quant'altro e, e cerchiamo di eh, semmai trattare bene il suolo facendo sì che il suolo da solo trovi un equilibrio e riesca a essere nutriente, accogliente per le piante che poi l'uomo consuma. E per questo lavoriamo con i metodi come le rotazioni agricole delle colture, eh, spostando leguminose, ortaggi e cereali eh, in modo tale da garantire anche al terreno il giusto riposo e, e cerchiamo quindi fondamentalmente di agire il meno possibile con metodi il meno possibile invadenti con, per avere una produzione peraltro di maggiore qualità rispettando i ritmi del, delle, delle, delle stagioni e le produzioni stagionali e quindi anche facendo lo sforzo di interagire e conoscere meglio il clima. My topic today is biodiversity and ecosystem services, one of the four key principles of organic agriculture, actually. The relevance and extreme importance of biodiversity, both below and above ground, does hardly to have to be re-emphasized, I think, in this group of people. But not only for its intrinsic value as source of resilience and potential for adoption to changes, uh, uh, sorry, adaptation uh, uh, to changes such as climate change, but also as the backbone uh, for ecosystem services, which depend on the very availability of this biodiversity. Healthy soils uh, are alive with all forms of life on Earth, as we know from bacteria, fungi, viruses, uh, nematodes, and up to small mammals, all key to assure that the soil ecosystem can handle the increasing physical and also biological stresses, which uh, we all know are coming up, um, and also provide ecosystem services, uh, such as nutrient cycling, water holding, carbon sequestration, uh, this among others. Uh, the biodiversity above ground provides resilience by increasing the capacity uh, for pest disease resistance and tolerance, both in its uh, varietal as well as genetic, genetic form, um, and uh, the supply of biological control, which I think is very important. So nature does not agree with reductionism. It needs the complexity made available by plant and animal diversity. Given the biodiversity is available, that means specially promoted through regenerative uh, agronomic practices, it will provide um, and support um, a healthy environment. And I think that's why we keep saying healthy people, healthy food, healthy environment, healthy animals. So it's all, all connected as we, as we know. And I think above all, all nutrient rich food and healthy people. If we know if we grow our food in healthy soils, we'll have more uh, nutritious food, which is a very big element, I think, of what we try to do in organic agriculture. All this is cost-free and renewable, as much needed, um, and a bonus, actually, uh, is to sequester extra carbon. And we need to reduce our 450 ppm out there right now down to 380 and maybe even to 350. So again, organic agriculture is the way to go because it helps. Not only because we're going to have more biodiversity, but because we can have with all this diversity, also underground, above ground, we can sequester uh, a whole lot more carbon. And again, you know, uh, deal with something which impedes or will impede agriculture a whole lot more in the future. So the implementation of organic agriculture in the framework of agroecology addresses all three sustainable development dimensions um, and it will be supported by the introduction of true costing that accounts for both the positive and as well as the negative externalities. So when we do true cost of accounting, we need to be sure that we also you know, uh, add in the positive, not only just talk about the negative ones. And I think organic agriculture is bound to bring very great results uh, in, in that direction. So there exists ample evidence uh, that we, with the organic agriculture 3.0 practices, 
The world can produce uh, food in sufficient quantity and above all quality, because the quantity is actually less the problem as the quality and where to nourish a global population at its peak in 2050 of some maybe 9 billion and a half billion, 9.5 billion people, or maybe less. I think uh, the trends now show that we even will be less people. So I think we need to stop uh, worrying about all this uh, talk about we need more fertilizer, more pesticide to grow more food. Let's do it the other way around. Let's see where we need more food, what quality of food we need, and what diversity. And I think that's where, again, this whole idea of diversity comes in, diversity of not only of the system, but what is inside that system, from farmers to crops, uh, um, which is all very, very important to assure a, a good future. So in order to address the SDGs broadly and efficiently and create synergies across goals while avoiding the negative feedbacks as much as possible, we need organic agriculture 3.0 and it has much to offer and it's uh, the way forward. ไข่ซื้อปลาบ่อจันทร์เมืองแปกแข่งเสียงขวางประเทศลาวไข่ได้อยู่กับครอบครัวแล้วมีลูกนำกันห้าคนปัจจุบันเขาใหญ่หมด
ซื้อผ้าของค่อยเมื่อได้มีโอกาสค่อยก็ได้มีการบริการให้พวกเขาเจ้ามีบางคนก็มาซื้อกับส่วนของค่อยโดยกงพวกเขาสังเกตเห็นว่าค่อยปลูกหยางแดในสวนและได้ซีบอกว่าเขาต้องการพักหยางแดภาวะเทียบใส่ลายหับการเฮ็ดหูกมือก่อนเพียงว่าปีหนึ่งได้ห้าหกล้านต่อปีย้อนเห่าลบจนถึงออกปัจจุบันค่อยมาเฮ็ดส่วนอินทรีย์แล้วถึงจะน้อยค่อยก็พอใจว่าย้อนค่อยได้มีลายหับทุกๆมือเป็นแปลงหลายมือก่อนเห่าก็กินพออยู่ได้ซื่อแต่ปัจจุบันนี้ถือว่าทุกอย่างทุกอย่างเขาพร้อมแล้วจะเป็นไก่จะเป็นปลาจะเป็นพืชพักเขาอยากสนิทใดเขาก็สามารถเลือกจะพื้นที่ของเขามาเฮ็ดกินเองอยู่ในเฮือนครัวเขาบรอดเดอร์สิสเตอร์สคอมมิชชั่นและเพื่อนสิกเกอร์สวันนี้ผมขอบคุณที่จะสามารถที่จะมาร่วมในฟอรัมนี้และแสดงความยินดีต่อทุกคนดังนั้นทำไมความสำคัญนี้ถึงเป็นสิ่งสำคัญที่สุดในโลกใบนี้ผมเชื่อว่าอาหารคือสิ่งสำคัญที่สุดในโลกใบนี้และผู้ผลิตอาหารคือสิ่งสำคัญที่สุดในโลกใบนี้และผู้ผลิตอาหารคือสิ่งสำคัญที่สุดในโลกใบนี้และผู้ผลิตอาหารคือสิ่งสำคัญที่สุดในโลกใบนี้และผู้ผลิตอาหารคือสิ่งสำคัญที่สุดในโลกใบนี้และผู้ผลิตอาหารคือสิ่งสำคัญที่สุดในโลกใบนี้และผู้ผลิตอาหารคือสิ่งสำคัญที่สุดในโลกใบนี้และผู้ผลิตอาหารคือสิ่งสำคัญที่ Are the providers of food. It is the direct and indirect interconnections between these elements of the cosmos that provide us food, good food, safe food. So, if this has to happen and keep happening for all time to come, then it is natural, only natural, that there should be equity, respect, and justice for and among all living beings in this ecology. That, in my opinion, is the meaning of the principle of fairness in the organic worldview. The primary actor in this whole cosmic dance is the farmer, and by the farmer I mean the smallholder farmer, the peasants. We also know that agriculture is responsible for 80% of the deforestation worldwide. However, this is not caused by the farmer I am talking about. This is caused by the large industrial forms of agriculture that have no respect for life on Earth, no space for equity or justice for any living being who inhabit this beautiful world of ours. In this reality, the small farmers, on the other hand, who grow most of our real food and bear all the risks, are slowly and steadily being erased from the story of agriculture. They who believe that the soil is their mother. Are becoming redundant in this paradigm of economics, where growth is not only indispensable but also infinite. Traditional agriculture has always practiced equity and justice for all living beings, where trust in life is an integral part of the farmer's worldview. Yet, the peasant in India today and possibly the world over is the lowest-paid worker. When they remain organic or turn organic. They actually honor us. They honor the earth. They honor the cosmos. They honor the denizens of this world. It becomes imperative then that the rest of the non-producers of food respect these farmers by not taking away their right to a good life. That they are compensated for all the risks they take to provide clean and safe food, while trying to maintain the ecological balance of a world. Increasingly being affected by climate change, that the earth is respected and compensated for all that we take from her, that the animals are respected and compensated for their services to the ecosystems, 
The principle of fairness is all about building strong, cordial, cooperative, honest, and respectful relationships. It's all about human dignity, solidarity, and social justice for all. Wherever I go, be it in India or abroad, people are wanting good food. Yet not everybody wants to pay premium that organic demands. And this is where the ideal of common goods economy comes in. The consumer should understand that their local farmers also want to live a good life. The farmers must understand that they are producers and providers of food that local consumers depend on and so should produce good food. We all need to trust and respect each other and then the rest will follow. I ended up in a field in North Dakota um, that actually belonged to a fellow by the name of Gabe Brown. And this was early April 2014, and it was a field that he had planted the previous autumn to a multi-species cover crop that he actually fed to his cattle. That was a real moment for me. All of a sudden, it meant that I needed to keep my soil covered. So I came home and and changed my thought process and tried to adapt what I'd seen in Gabe's field to my own. When we get a heavy rainfall event, once upon a time I would see soil literally like chocolate brown water running from my field, whereas now that water's clean. So that was the first benefit. Um, the second benefit is a reduction in the, in the necessity for um, synthetic forms of fertiliser. So I've been able to significantly reduce the amount of, of nitrogen in particular and phosphorus that I've been applying to my fields. When you plant a multi-species cover crop, how do you harvest it? Well guess what? They harvest it for me and they turn it into beef. So there is my production. Most of us know how good worms are at um, helping to improve soil function. Well, dung beetles are even better because they actually dig big burrows in your soil and they take that dung down inside the soil, but then you've got all this other good stuff like your water and your air infiltration that follows those dung beetles down into the soil. So it's, a, it's another way that I can address those key underlying issues that I started with. You change your intent from having a, a bare, dead fallow to a, a covered, living fallow. Now what we are growing here, we are growing bananas and we, we are producing them organically. One can see how these bananas look like, but in order to produce such nice looking banana bunches, it requires one to utilize organic manure. And for me, I just utilize the pottery manure. Pottery manure promotes the better soils, and also whenever there is, uh, you know, you, you see how the, the soil looks like. The soil is like dark color, which is a mixture of the sandy soil and, uh, and organic manure. This plant has a capacity to stay here more than 10 years promoting or producing the, the bananas for, for home consumption and also for sale. In this country, this is a food security because if you plant a banana, it stands to give you more than 10 to 15 bunches. But every year it can produce three to four bunches of which in the Ugandan currency, this one can sell like 20 to 30,000 per bunch. That is an income. And the challenge for this country in the raw settings is for the people to be able to earn an income on a daily, on a weekly, and a monthly basis. By growing bananas and the coffee, as you can see around here, it is possible 
for the farmer to earn an income on daily, on weekly and a monthly basis. The principle of care. I find the principle of care is a backbone, is the one that really unites all principles. You can't think about ecology without care. You can't think about health without care. You can't think about health without care. Care is all around and is what makes the change is what brings change. When I care about you, when I care about my own health, I care about your health, the health of soils, the health of the planet, that brings the energy and effort that will push change. We are facing a very unique moment in time. We are facing a pandemic, something my generation at least, um, early 30s so for me is quite new a pandemic that has no borders no money borders no physical borders no anything the only thing we have to face it is to care about each other to try to protect each other uh, we are currently in lockdown in my country because we are protecting each other it's not about me it's about me not infecting others. And that care that I stay at home because I want to protect others is a spirit that should bring us and that we should implement in our daily life. And this is only one problem we face in a bigger, in a much bigger problem we are really facing that is climate crisis. What future we will leave to our next generation, to my generation, actually, I might not even see it. But the ones coming after me, they, they will suffer it. So it's the time now to care, to really care of the steps we take, of the decisions we make, and how we design the future we want to see, the reality we want to build, we have an opportunity with this pandemic to really get out of business as usual and really start a new paradigm, to really start a new reality. But it's up to us and it's about how much we care about that future, about those others, those worms, those birds, those animals, the, that earth, those tomatoes, your family, your community, all those that are around you. That's why I believe the principle of care is really a backbone of all principles. That's why we need to care. We need to care about our present, about our future, about all that is around us. Warm greetings from Fiji. Thank you for the opportunity to be with you today. The Pacific's a unique region, thousands of small islands in the world's largest ocean, uh, with many commonalities, but also rich diversity culturally, geographically, and historically. Our biggest concerns though are of course global in nature, climate change, 
but loss of biodiversity and the impact of our food systems on our health. But principles-based organic agriculture can provide a solution to these challenges and help contribute to our sustainable development. But I stress the principles-based part of that statement. We could possibly convert all of global agricultural production to organic based on a set of rules that limits the use of dangerous chemicals and practices. But ultimately that doesn't change our food production systems in the way that we need if we're to contribute to those big global challenges. We could easily just have an agricultural industrial complex that replaces toxic inputs with organic ones. But all the other vitally important things about the way we produce our food and work with our ecosystems, protect our health and, and culture, wouldn't necessarily be benefiting. As you've heard from previous presentations, the principles apply to agriculture in the broader sense. It's about the way people interact with landscapes. It's about the way we relate to each other and how we shape the legacy for future generations. The principles express the contribution that organic agriculture can make to the world and a vision to improve all agriculture. Agriculture doesn't only feed us, our history, our culture, our community values are all embedded in agriculture. I'd like to reflect a little bit on what some of those global challenges look like in the Pacific and sea level rise is the most obvious example. Some of our islands like Tuvalu are only a meter or two above sea level at their highest points and some predictions put them entirely underwater in the not too distant future. Here in Fiji, we have earmarked 60 villages that need to be relocated inland. And it's not just about the complexity of new infrastructure or the cost, it's about the dislocation of communities and entire cultures, the loss of sense of place and self and identity. And we've had this experience before in the Pacific. We've had entire island communities displaced when their islands became unlivable due to phosphate mining for fertilizer. The Banaman community of Kiribati is an example. They now currently all are relocated in Fiji. And I'm sure the farmers that used that phosphate had no idea that their farming practices would have that sort of impact across the other side of the globe. Other impacts of climate are of course drought. Uh, we're having extended dry spells. Uh, in the last five years, several countries have had to ship in uh, drinking water and desalination plants just to survive these unusually long droughts. Tropical cyclones are likely to become stronger and more frequent. Uh, and right now I'm actually keeping my fingers crossed that we get this recording done before the next really noisy downpour associated with a cyclone that, that devastated Vanuatu two days ago with winds of up to 235 kilometers an hour. Loss of biodiversity is also really significant. Commercialization of taro farming in Samoa, for example, moved farmers from a diverse traditional agroforestry system with many varieties of taro and other species to large monocrop plantations of taro just with one variety. A blight came in and wiped out the entire industry in three months, uh, took millions of dollars out of the economy and the staple food was gone, leading to major changes in dietary habits. Maybe if we'd maintained those diverse varieties, some of which had resistance to the blight and kept more diversity in our farms, we would have been able to lessen the impact of that pest infestation when it came through. That leads me to my last point, the impact of our food systems on health. Globalization has really changed how we eat in the Pacific. We now eat the big three, corn, wheat and rice, which were never part of our diets. And of course, we eat a lot more processed food, high in sugar and high in salt. Why? Because they're cheap. They're mass produced and supported by subsidies and the true cost of production like environmental impact isn't considered. So they get to our shelves at a really low price point. We're not nations with a lot of cash in our pockets and price point is a really powerful driver for consumers. We now have the highest rates of non-communicable diseases like diabetes in the world and growing weights, rates of micronutrient deficiencies. In the Marshall Islands, one in three children under five has stunted growth. And here in Fiji, someone has an amputation every 11 hours due to complications from diabetes. And we only have a population of 900,000 people. The good news, it's not all bad. All of those challenges can be overcome through building a food system based on the principles of organic agriculture. This requires a mind, ch mind change, a mindset change, and a vision that can only happen when we truly recognize how interconnected and interdependent we all are. Agriculture wise, we're connected through the globalization of the food system, but our cultures and our homes, food connects us to others. It nourishes us.
So we must build food systems that support that nourishment of our bodies, nourishment of our communities and nourishment of our planet. These are really important discussions and I'd like to thank you again for enabling me to be part of this and I wish you well for the rest of the conference. And we are back live after watching our video. I'm glad to see so many of you are logging on uh, and I want to welcome you all back here. Uh, some really great questions have been coming up on Slido uh, and we are looking through them. Some of our panelists already and uh, the, panels will be, uh, the panel will be ready to answer those questions very soon. Uh, again, uh, if you like tweeting, please tweet. Uh, participate, keep going with us through this. Uh, we will check back into the Slido questions very soon. Uh, I would like to start the next uh, panel discussion. Um, this will be moderated by my colleague Gabor Figetsky. He is the head of global policy at iFarm Organics International, and he has been involved in environmental and agriculture for many, many years. He, uh, apart from being the head of global policy here, he's really been working very hard promoting agroecology as a viable solution that can deliver results on all the SDGs. And uh, I think he's a very, very good person to uh, manage the next panel that is coming up. The panel will be talking about organic agriculture, the role that it can play in security and livelihood security. And uh, you can share your questions, as we said, through Slido. We'll ask as many as we can, and if you are tweeting, use hashtag eat, eat honest. And remember on the site that translation is available in French and Spanish. Unfortunately, not for the videos, but for this session. So, with all of that said, I would like to hand over to Gabor, and he will introduce our panel. Gabor. Thank you very much, Conrad, for, for the kind introduction. It is actually a true honor to be the moderator of this distinguished panel today. Um, this is a Q&A session. And first of all, I would like to thank our five speakers on it uh, for accepting our invitation. Uh, four of our speakers serve on the world board of iPhone Organics International. And Louisa, our executive, executive director, is joining them. It is a truly global panel. Uh, we have our speakers dialing in from Argentina, India, Germany, the USA, and Fiji. All of them conveniently confined to their homes like most of us in this strange world we have today. Before starting with the Q&A, however, um, I would like to turn to our wonderful and highly active audience to ask you to send us your questions to our panelists while listening to them as they speak. Uh, you can type in your questions in the online Slido platform um, where you joined the event. Uh, when doing so, please always mention your name, your country or region you are writing us from and possibly your affiliation, so the company or organization you are working for or you're, you are studying in. Um, you better be quick, um, as after the first round of responses uh, we get from the panel, so in around, uh, let's say, 20 minutes, uh, we will already select the questions uh, with the highest number of upvotes uh, to be answered by them uh, in the second round. Um, and so with a few thousands of people registered for, for this forum, uh, we expect a lot of questions to come in. Therefore, we will try to merge some of them and we will have to be somewhat selective. So please don't get disappointed if your input is not addressed in the end. Um, all contact details will be shared later and we will be very happy to get back to you after the session. Um, and of course, you are very welcome to tweet anytime using the hashtags EatHonest and ThinkLandscape. So let's jump, jump now to our main topic today, uh, which is the challenges we have for and with global agriculture and food systems, um, possible ways and scenarios to fix them, and what role can organic agriculture play in this. Our first speaker today is our Vice President, Karen Mapusua. Karen has been working for close to 20 years on empowering farmers in the Pacific community, serving 22 Pacific Island states. She's a national of Samoa and Australia, and is based in Fiji now. She has a background in NGO capacity building and management, and she always looked at organic agriculture as a path to social and economic development. 
Uh, she is the co-founder um, of uh, the organization called POETCOM, which stands for the Pacific Organic and Ethical Trade Community, and was extensively involved uh, in developing um, alternative forms of certification that empower farmers. Karen, um, how does uh, our global agriculture and uh, food systems look today? Uh, who produces the majority of our food and what are the challenges that they are facing? Thanks, Gabor. That's a, a really interesting question. I think agriculture is a bit of a world of extremes for us at the moment. We've got the corporatization of um, industrialized agriculture, really high levels of mechanization and intensive farming, um, which are often environmentally quite destructive. But there's an estimated 600 million farms worldwide, and 70% of those are under one hectare. And they only equal 7% of all agricultural land. So we've got this mix of big and small. Um, often, but not always, those small farmers are using more environmentally friendly methods, agroecology, and often carrying on from traditional practices. Um, but it's those small farmers that actually provide 70 to 80% of the world's food, depending on different sets of statistics. And of course, they're feeding into their own local markets, um, but also into those long commodity supply chains that we all enjoy, like coffee and cocoa and bananas. Um, so it's at a couple of different levels. The challenges, I think, in the, the sort of story of smallholders, and it's, it's similar but different, I think, across the world. Uh, smallholders are very vulnerable to economic and environmental shocks. They generally have quite low incomes. They're subject to really volatile commodity prices. Um, the, the livelihoods they have are high in labor and operating costs, but often get very low investment and not a lot of profit. Across the global south, and I think probably across all smallholders, uh, we're really bearing the brunt of the climate change um, crises that we're experiencing. And agricultural production is being significantly impacted by these unpredictable weather patterns and the extremes that we're already seeing, intensified heat, natural disasters, droughts. This combined with low access to adaptive technologies and aging farming population, the volatile markets and little or no social protection really puts the small producers at risk. I guess you could say now that the smallholders are facing a triple livelihood crisis. It's climate, it's price, and of course now health with the, with the COVID issue. And many governments are recognizing farmers as an essential service, but the current state of the way agriculture is supported and the support provided to farmers doesn't really reflect the essential services that our smallholders provide because they really do feed the world. Thanks, Gabor. Thank you very much, Karen, for this uh, comprehensive uh, response and uh, answer. Um, and also thank you for uh, giving a very hands-on uh, examples from, from your own experience. Um, now I'm turning to um, our uh, World Board member uh, from India, uh, who is our next speaker, uh, who is a development activist himself. Um, and social entrepreneur and a change maker working with marginalized and rural populations uh, in Andhra Pradesh, India. He is now the chief functionary and executive director of the Timbuktu Collective, uh, who with 40 year years of experience uh, directs the collective's efforts to promote several producer-owned rural businesses, business enterprises. Um, Bablu has been a member of the World Board of Art from Organics International since uh, 2017. Bablu, um, at times of crisis like uh, this one with COVID-19, um, the economic implications of which we are probably just starting to feel, uh, standing together can mean more than anything. Will you be able to rely on your people's power to re revitalize economy on, in your locality? And also, uh, women often play a key role in such revitalization revitalization processes. Uh, can you shed a light on how organic agriculture helps empower them to play this role? Well, we, we, we work uh, not just with smallholder farmers. We work with landless laborers, artisans, people with disabilities, children, and, other, and most of all women. Other than the farmers cooperative, the disabled people's cooperative, etc. We have promoted uh, women's cooperatives. 
and they have about 23,000 members and they manage an incredibly successful alternative banking program with about 3.3 million US dollars as their uh, uh, capital. So this has made them into a massive force in the area and they're able to make their voices heard. We've been working with them for over 27 years and they understand local economics very well. At this time of crisis, we have been in touch with almost all the 25,000 families that we work with. Everybody is waiting to restart their work. The farmers cooperative is uh, preparing to start pr procuring the crops. They have prepared uh, the processing center, are getting ready to go in for production. If all goes well, from May, we will start the crop planning process in the villages for the coming Karif agricultural season. The women's cooperatives will, of course, be key in this economic revitalization, as they are the ones that have the money that will be required to start up. Most of the other cooperatives, all of them, are in some way or the other into economic activities and have women leaders who are also members of the women's uh, co-ops. So I believe that um, we will be able to restart the whole uh, economic uh, revitalization that will be required once this whole pandemic thing kind of goes down. Thank you for your wisdom, Bablu, and for the insight into the amazing work that you're doing with and for your communities. Um, when it comes to uh, social groups, uh, we shouldn't talk only talk about the role of women. In many parts of the world, citizens get more and more uh, detached from agriculture and farmers. And the younger generation seem to be harder and harder to reach and get engaged in agriculture. Um, our next guest in the panel today is Julia Lernu, uh, who established a group called Young Organics, exactly with the purpose of connecting young organic actors and to enhance knowledge transfer between the generations. Uh, her story started at her family organic, uh, family's uh, organic farm and the family company Arinco Organico, an organic retailer, exporter, and restaurant. Uh, Julie organized several times the presence of organic food in massive music festivals, and where once people only had fast food choices, they had fresh, real food full of flavor and color at reasonable prices, showing that organic food can, can be for everybody. Later, she became a scientist and worked for the Research Institute of Organic Agriculture on the collection of organic market, market data worldwide and the production of an, the annual report the world of organic agriculture, which is the main source of data on organic agriculture globally. Uh, Julia, how can we make sure that young people want to be part of the agriculture of the future? Hi, Gabor. Thank you. And um, thank you, the, the others, the previous coming. It's very interesting, the discussion. And I think it's not only young people we need to get back into agriculture or back connected again with food itself, no? Uh, I think humanity as a whole has disconnected from food and that comes also disconnection from agriculture. When we started Yard Organic, one thing was how we can make agriculture a bit more sexy for the youth. Now, we have to understand that in many parts of the world, I come from Argentina, it's a very large country where distances are quite extensive. So maybe the nearby town to your farm is 100 kilometers. So how you connect with people, uh, it's hard to make a living sometimes from farming in many cases actually. So actually young generations are not very tempted to stay in farming. So we start to see a lot of migration from farms to the cities and actually, what we see now is that those, pe those young people come from the farms to the cities and look for a better life. They are actually not reaching that better life. They are in the slums or in really the poor areas of the cities. And so with Young Organics and with the work we are doing at iPhone, trying to connect with the youth, trying to make this more sexy and more attractive, the farming for the youth, 
I think is a crucial part, but we need to work also on how we make, how we reconnect with food as a whole, no? Not that it only comes from a supermarket, from a vending machine, or it comes from a restaurant, but it comes from a grower. And bring pride to that grower, no? Really make farmers a key actor in the game. Uh, we have forgotten that now it's more important the factory of a phone or a computer than a farmer that I always remember a human being as any animal needs good air, good water, good food to survive. We don't need clothes, we don't need, it's, of course it's much better, it's much better to have shelter, but we need good food. We really need good food to survive. So I think we need to bring back that discussion and take away the shame of the farmers. Of, and for that, we need to ensure empowerment to farmers. We need to ensure good livelihoods, good incomes, true costs for them, uh, that they have the tools and the access. And for especially for young people, what we have been working a lot is to create platforms where they can meet. You, as what I just said, the large distances sometimes they face. Um, it's a full-time job to be a farmer, so there's not much time to socialize. So really create places where young people can interact. We have great examples at iFarm with the Youth Forum, where people from all across Asia gather together and exchange their experiences. So they feel they are part of a bigger community, that they are not alone in this journey. I think that's a crucial part. But it should go in hand with work with consumers, work as a society. I think now with the pandemic, we are recognizing the value of health workers, of the police, of the people working that make the daily life easier. But we forget sometimes that we also should clap. We are clapping every night here in Argentina at night, 9 p.m. to the doctors, but we should also clap to the farmers and remember that without them we wouldn't have food, no? So I think it's a, it's a bigger change we need to have. I think we are on that way because more consciousness is around, also because climate change is forcing us, discussion is forcing us, but um, yeah, I think help them connect, especially for the young people, help them give them platforms to connect, to stay, not feel alone, bring proudness for farmers, reconnect with food, with farming, consumers, etc. I think those are the main points. Maybe it was a bit too much. Thanks a lot, Julia, um, for outlining what, what we actually need to do to uh, reconnect farm to farmers and also to to give them uh, the the recognition that they actually deserve so a clap to the farmers is actually a great idea um, our next speaker was also raised uh, on a family farm but this family farm was in the Netherlands and uh, then she went on studying biology and philosophy at the Utrecht uh, University uh, she is uh, Louisa Lutikholt, our executive director uh, since 2018, and she has extensive experience in organic agriculture, fair trade, and international development cooperation. Her career has included work for Fair Trade International and the Swiss development organization Helvetas. Louisa, you were the main driving force behind the articulation and the def definition of the four principles of organic agriculture. Uh, how can these principles uh, guide us in fixing uh, our broken food systems? Well, thank you, Gabor, for your question and pointing back to the uh, principles. And I think part of the answer to your question is already in the way you uh, pose it. Because we have to look at food again in terms of food system. And a food system is more than only a farmer providing to supermarket. We have to think about everything that is around it and that influences this food system. So what's the education that we provide to the farmer, but also what's the education that we provide to the consumer? How are we relating to input companies and what kind of power do they have in the market? How uh, independent are farmers in making their own choices or how much are they driven by um, 
by things like shame that Julia just said, or maybe by uh, influence on, on uh, projection on short time uh, gain. And how much do they have the opportunity to actually take care for their environment or are they in a bare survival mode? And then also we need to look at how um, the supply chain works and how supermarkets uh, set a price. Uh, and there the question comes whether this price really represents the full cost of what a, a, a healthy and nutritious product costs. So if we look at the principles of organic agriculture, basically they point to all kinds of externalities that there are and that organic agriculture tries to include. And if we then include that again and look at that as a whole in the food system, then we can maybe come to solving some of the challenges that we have. Or the other way around, I think that we have some of the challenges now because we take food as just any other product that there is in the market. Whereas basically it's the basic of our living, it's our livelihood, and it's also the basic of our environment. Thank you very much, Louisa, um, for outlining um, all the benefits and also um, of a, a more sustainable way of farming and also reminding us of the ex externalities our society has to be there. Uh, due to uh, conventional agriculture. Um, now we've come to the end of the first round of questions, and I think it is time for us to, to hear uh, what the audience is interested in. Um, I can tell you we are in a difficult situation trying to rapidly select and merge your questions coming in from all parts of the world. Um, but maybe uh, we can start with the one uh, that has come in from Pim van der, van der Horst in the Netherlands. Um, how can we reduce the gap between conventional and organic agriculture without giving in on the fields of productivity and sustainability? Um, Karen, would you be interested in answering this one? Yes, I can give that a go. Gabor, thanks for the question. And it's I guess it's the million dollar question because we often hear about the yield gap between conventional product and organic product. But I think we need to sort of maybe broaden the discussion a little bit um, so that we're not only looking at productivity. That Yes, that is very, very important, but there are a whole lot of other things that help balance up that yield gap question. And one of those things is that we know that organic systems often actually perform better in marginal lands or in poor growing conditions. And as we are moving into a changing climate and all those different scenarios, it might well be that over time, our organic systems are naturally building that yield gap because the conventional systems aren't so resilient and won't do so well in that changing environment. The other thing I think we need to consider is where food waste fits into this picture. Yes, there is a yield gap, but we are also wasting a huge amount of food. And a lot of the recent climate change discussions have pointed in that direction as something we really need to address in the whole climate and sustainability discussion. But I guess the other really important thing is research. Um, most resources for agricultural research go into the conventional field. If we can redirect even a small portion of that towards um, studying organic systems and looking for the solutions that farmers need, that's another way we can bridge that gap. Uh, and it's been an area that really is neglected uh, in our budgets for research in agriculture. We can switch that. We'll definitely be able to go away towards addressing that yield gap. I hope that starts to answer a very complex question. Thank you very much, Karen, for the comprehensive response to this question. Our next one would be then a question from uh, Oisin. I, I believe this is an Irish name. Uh, could you touch on the main differences between agroecological and organic practices and farming? As I understand, an agroecological can be organic and vice versa. So is there a defining important difference? Um, Julia, would you take this one? Thank you, Gabor. Yeah, I will try. Um, well, basically in the organic movement, I form organic, we have defined what organic is. Agroecology, uh, agroecology is quite of a big term that involves many things. We find organic is inside the agroecology family. But we can see that agroecology means something in Latin America, in the Pacific, in Africa, in Europe. It 
it changes a bit. We have the 10 basic principles from FAO to define what agroecology is, and we see organic as part of it. Organic, however, is quite defined in many countries. We have actual public standards that define what organic is and what is not. We have control systems to um, verified, we have such a species or third party certification, etc. But in principle, I think we are all going towards a better agricultural system, a more inclusive, more fair. So I always see it as part of the big family, no? Where, um, yes, here in the question it says organic and agriculture are the same, vice versa. In many ways, they are, in some ways, they're differentiate each other, organic has a specific methods, has specific priorities, and, but I think we are very in line and we are in this work together. That's why with the new uh, strategy and with Organic 3.0, as we call it, we are trying to work all together towards this new agricultural system, this new paradigm where we see farming in more harmony with nature, in harmony with societies, in harmony with farmers, in, that's the bigger picture. So I would say in brief words that yes, we have the big globe of agroecology, organic is part of it, is inside it. It might be a bit more defined, but we feel a part of a bigger family. I hope that helped. Yes, definitely. Thanks a lot, Julia. Um, now we have a next one which has come in from Ibrahim from Morocco um, and I think uh, Luisa you already touched a little bit upon this question so I would give this one to you. Why does organic food have to be more expensive than just normal food? Gabor, I'm here but I try to start my video and um, it currently says I can't but if you allow me I would just uh, try to speak without video. Oh here I am. So um, when we look at um, yeah, the costs of food and the price of food, I think we have to differentiate two different things. So most probably uh, the, the person who poses the question is looking at what uh, she pays or he pays at the counter. Um, but we are not sure whether the price that you pay at the counter actually reflects the true costs. So we have to look a little bit deeper and um, when we currently look to chemical agriculture, we pay the costs somewhere else. And um, the first time when we pay costs, when there are costs for chemical agriculture, is when our tax money is going to go into subsidies for farmers to buy, for instance, chemical fertilizers and chemical pesticides. Then the second time is when we really go to a market or a supermarket and pay for the produce. But then there are a third time when there are also costs from chemical industrial agriculture. And that is when we suffer with our health from, for instance, water that's not clean. And a fourth time uh, is also when we need to uh, pay for cleaning up and have environmental costs. So we have to look a little bit deeper and see whether the price that we currently pay for agricultural products really reflect the costs. And, uh, the point that I'm trying to make is that uh, most of the products that are produced with uh, chemicals do not reflect the true costs. Now, if we look at organic agriculture, the cost I just talked about, health, clean water, um, no subsidies, they're already included in what we pay when we buy the product at the market. And so then we say they are internalized. And so basically, uh, it's not a, a fair game that we're playing there. So that's why we are pleading for something that we call true cost accounting. And we look at all the costs and externalities that the production uh, has. And then again, it would be interesting to really compare uh, the price of both organic agriculture products and products that are produced by chemical agriculture. And we definitely may say a differentiation there, a difference there as well. And now it would be even interesting if we were to go one step further, if we really would impose those costs in the final product price, because that might well be a uh, stimulus and an um, 
incentive for farmers to try to move to more sustainable practices. And that's exactly what we would like to see happen. So I hope that this um, clarified a little bit. Um, but I think it's, yeah, the main point is to make a differentiation between price and the costs that are behind them. Yeah, I think it definitely did. Um, I think a, a level playing field is, is what we need for, for all sorts of uh, agricultural products. Um, our next question um, seems to be coming from someone who, who is more involved uh, with organic agriculture. Uh, his name is Stephen Jacobs uh, from the Organic Farmers and Growers uh, Organic Control Board, Body, I guess. Um, and he's asking, organic is a whole system approach. How do we enable a transition to a whole system approach from those not yet engaging with organic food systems? Um, Babalu, you are someone who is engaging a lot of uh, people from your community. Would you be able to address this question? Can you just repeat the question once more? Um... So uh, organic is a whole system approach. How do we enable a transition to a whole system approach from those not yet engaging with organic food systems? Well, I mean, if one really wants to do organic farming, one has to go in the whole hog. And uh, I mean, I'm saying this from my personal experience that un unless we look at our land and our soil and where we come from or where we are doing farming, unless and until we look at that as one agroecological system and relate to each one of them, it's like, like doing a permaculture design. And if you don't design it in such a way that you, you look at all the aspects of organic farming, then it doesn't really work. And that includes participation in the value chain. Uh, you know, in, in, in the whole process of adding value to the product, in the whole process of reaching out to the consumers. Um, so, yeah, basically, if you want to do organic, then you have to go the whole hog. Is what I'm what I mean to say. I don't know if this answers the question, but um, um, I really hope so. Um, I I understood it the same way as you did, probably. Um, Karen, uh, the next question uh, would uh, go to you. Uh, will the organic sector? Uh, the question is from Federica. Uh, from Italy, uh, will the organic sector come out from this pandemic crisis strengthened? How can we uh, leverage that uh, the current situation to advocate for more support for organic and agroecology? Mm. Yeah, the the current disruption I think has um, enormous potential for the organic sector. Um, what we are seeing is so many shifts in supply chain and a real recognition that we need to be able to sometimes get our food just a little bit closer to home. Um, and also that we need to be able to grow food that is not always entirely dependent on a whole lot of external inputs as well. So I think there's a, some mind shifts around that that will happen out of this pandemic and this crisis that is currently happening. Um, I think we need to be able to demonstrate also to the world what we can provide as an organic sector. Uh, that there are ways of growing that aren't dependent on shipping your fertilizer from across the, the world or your pesticides or something else. Um, so we do need to be able to demonstrate that, I think, very effectively. And that's where the advocacy comes in. We, we need to walk the talk. If I'm a farmer, I like to see it working in someone else's field. I won't necessarily listen to what someone is telling me is going to work. It has to be demonstrated. So if we can make the, you know, use this, crisis to demonstrate that. Um, I think that will be a really valuable thing. Um, just going back to, can we come out of this strengthened? I think we can not only come out of it strengthened, but we can come out of it leading. This is an opportunity to really examine the food system and look at all the things that could be corrected. I don't think that with COVID we're learning 
anything new. We know that these problems existed in the food system. Um, we know that there's distribution issues. We know that there's injustice issues. There's, we know that there's environmental damage. But often it's only seen when there's a disaster somewhere or when there's a particular issue in one country. Now we're all affected. Uh, there's no way out for anybody except to, to come together in this. So I think from that point of view alone, the fact that this is really highlighting those problems that have existed for such a long time, it gives us a good platform to really reflect and say, okay, let's do something different. And that should really be our starting point. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Karen. Um, our next question is coming from Wong, Malaysia. And um, the question is, why does organic has to be related to soil? I think this is a great question. Can the vegetables from soil-less production, such as hydroponic farming, aquaponic, and uh, aeroponic, consider organic? Um, Louisa, would you go for this one? And I would like to ask you to limit your contribution to two minutes now, because we have to wrap up soon. Well, two minutes is quite short for such a profound question. Um, in organic agriculture, we uh, put a lot of emphasis on soil and soil health, as that is uh, the basis, not only for food production, but also for uh, a broader relation with the nature and uh, the environment. And so if we take, care, uh, take good care for soil, we also take good care for um, ourselves and, and for the future. Um, there have been, of course, systems and there are even uh, water salads that, that grow on water from their natural perspective um, themselves. But we do think that the interaction with a healthy soil, with a plant, is of importance in organic agriculture. There's another aspect to um, soilless production as well, and that uh, has to do with a totally different motivation that is behind it. Um, which looked like and if we can um, produce, let's say, in factory kind ways, um, which moves us actually away from a clear interaction with uh, the nature on which we depend around us. And even if we were to do to work in hydroponics, still the seeds come from somewhere in nature um, and even um, some of the feeding stuff that we need to have. So why fake that environment if you can also do it live and have the benefit of all the nutrients that the roots can take up from the soil? Um, I know there are attempts in uh, using hydroponics uh, in, for instance, city cases and others, but we still believe that uh, for organic agriculture, soil is the basis. And so that's why we have drawn a clear line there that hydroponics are not part of organic, but actually uh, that plant should be in interaction with the healthy soil to provide a healthy food for all of us. Thank you very much, Louisa. Um, with this conscious of the time, we will have to wrap up, wrap up I'm afraid, and I'm just realizing as, as we are doing such a Q&A, how little ground we can actually cover uh, within 40 minutes. So I have to apologize to all of you who didn't get your questions answered. Our time was, was very limited. Um, so get, to get you, all your answers, please join us on Facebook and read our blog, Organic Without Boundaries. Uh, we might have covered some of your topics there, but you're also very welcome to suggest topics to, to uh, this blog. Anyhow, to me personally, it was an extremely insightful discussion covering uh, so, many, so many aspects of global agriculture and the contribution of agroecology as well as organic, uh, from science and innovations to livelihoods and community building, from empowering women and youth to tackling climate change and biodiversity loss. So a big thank you to all the panelists for their eloquent contributions. Um, with organic offering so much to a circular economy, I'm even more excited to listen to the debate on a possible brave new world without farmers, where all the food will come from labs. But first, we will hear from farmers themselves. So stay safe, stay home, and stay tuned. It's back to Conrad now. Great. Uh, thanks, Gabor. Thank you very much for that uh, moderating that session. I think it was it was really good to hear from uh, people from across the world. We had. Uh, uh, the time zones really at their extremes, all the way from the one side of the date line to nearly the other. And um, 
uh, yeah, thanks to the uh, thanks to the uh, the panel. And yes, we will go and chat to farmers now very soon. Uh, we had this question earlier; it popped up in our interaction with you. Why don't we talk to farmers? Why don't we ask farmers the questions? And we will be doing that very very soon. Uh, before we do that, um, just to remind you again, join our conversation. Go to slide. This is where we are from now. The second room in Slido, that's where we will have questions. That's where we will also um, take your questions for the next panel. And, um, and uh, also tweet, keep going, keep listening, and keep sharing with us. We are going to have what I would like to call an intergenerational conversation between three farmers from different landscapes, from different generations. Uh, we have Bob Quinn. He's uh, an organic farmer, activist, and businessman from the U.S. We have Kaluki Paul Motuka, a young farmer from Uganda, an urban farmer from Uganda. Uh, but before we welcome them live, we're going to have a very, very quick video about the landscapes to show us where they are calling from. After the video, we will start the panel discussion. Great, very, very quick to uh, central equatorial Africa uh, on the eastern side. Uh, yes, and we have our three uh, panelists in our room, um, and we're going to spend time with them for the next, uh, let's say, 30, 30 odd minutes. Um, I would like to start by just letting the panelists introduce themselves. I would like you all to tell us a little bit about yourselves, uh, tell us about your farm, and tell us always my most important, important question when I do training with groups, why? Why are we? we start with Laureen, and I'm going to ask her to share with us. And I will be a bit of a hard taskmaster if, we, uh, if we're starting to run a little bit late. I will uh, cut you short. Uh, please forgive me for that. Laureen, are you there? Yeah. Hi. Hi, Laureen. Uh, we need to your camera on. Yeah. Okay. And yeah. unmuted. Yes, we can see you. Please go ahead, Lorraine. Good to see you again. Uh, you too. Hi, Conrad. Um, hi. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Lorraine. I am a farmer from Uganda. I, we currently, we are family farmers. So I farm with my mom on um, 70 acres in Kayunga. And we currently have about five staff, temporary staff. But we also work with the community where we also source uh, food from. Great. Uh, so that's already, we're talking about intergenerational. You are intergenerational in, on your farm. You and yeah. your, uh, your family working together and working with the community. And uh, that's great. It's good to hear that. And uh, I want to move just a little bit across around the uh, Lake Victoria and move uh, down to Kenya and uh, introduce Paul. 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 Uh, uh, welcome to the show and tell us a little bit about where you come from, why you farm, and how you farm. Thank you, Conrad. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Kaluki Pon Mutuku, and I'm uh, 27 years old. Kenyan youth working with farmers in Machakos uh, under the Green Treasures Farms, where we seek to intensify uh, environmental uh, sustainability through working with different families to train them about organic farming biodiversity conservation, and of course, trying to enhance soil care and how they can improve their uh, livelihoods. And for me, I think it's important to engage in organic farming because it's the very lifeline towards healthy communities and towards a healthy environment. I think that is my reason for always championing for nature. Thank you. 
Thanks, uh, uh, Motoko. This is uh, uh, yeah, really a healthy lifeline to uh, you know communities and, and and our agriculture and environment. I think it's really it's a really good strong reason why we should be doing this. Uh, good. We're going to uh, hop, skip, jump over Africa, move across the which one is that? The uh, the Atlantic Ocean. Yes, uh, and move all the way to Montana and welcome Bob Quinn uh, to share a little bit uh, from his side. Bob. Hello, <clears throat> it's great to be here. <clears throat> well, I have, um, we live on a uh, family um, farm of about um, uh, 1,700 hectares or about 4,000 acres. My grandfather started in 1920. My father uh, was raised here, I was raised here, and I raised my children here. So we have um, been farming now this, this farm 100 years. Uh, 30 years ago, I changed uh, to organic, 100% um, organic. And over 30 years, we've been farming organically. I, it's, to me, it's a lot more fun. Um, it's uh, more profitable, and it's, uh, it's a great um, source of satisfaction to me because now instead of commodities, we're actually growing food. And to me, that's very important. And we've been able to um, increase our involvement in the community by starting uh, small um, enterprises next to the farm. We, we, do, uh, we have oil. Uh, safflower, made from safflower we grow on the farm, we crush it on our farm, we sell it locally and to university kitchens in, in Montana. Uh, we make snacks with our, um, our ancient grain and we have been able to uh, bring about, uh, create about 10 more jobs in our little small community of Big Sandy, which is only 600 people and we've increased the population of that by <clears throat> over 6% in the last uh, 10 to 15 years, so we're very excited about that. Great, thanks, Bob. I think it's uh, it's really great to hear that, see that a few things that you are picking up on now. The one being um, the diversifying of what you're doing, not just farming, but also uh, interconnecting with the value chain and uh, interconnecting with the community beyond that. I think that's a very, very important uh, point. And then I want to pick up on something. This uh, generation uh, you mentioned to me before when we were chatting that in your case, um, uh, your children are not. Uh, taking part in the farming activity. Now, how do you um, overcome that to still incorporate uh, the youth and the generations into farming practice and, and, and into the work that you're doing? <clears throat> well, I have five children and they've all chosen other careers rather than coming back to the farm. And now we have about 19 grandchildren. So I'm hoping maybe one of those would be interested in the next um, um, few decades. But meanwhile, I've decided after farming for 40 years to turn over my farm to the next generation. So I've <clears throat> taken <clears throat> two of, the, two of, the, um, of our employees um, that worked, one worked for me for six years, another for two. And uh, I have rented the entire farm to them. So now the next generation is in charge and they are farming organically and building upon what I have taught them. And um, each of them has brought a brother or a brother-in-law in one case. So they have four families now living and being supported by this farm that used to just support one. So we're very excited about that and seeing how the next generation can be involved in, in increasing um, the support of more people in our local community. Great. Yes. Yeah, so it's not always just about the own family and the own people being involved, but, uh, but reaching out to your community. And I want to actually move that same question across. Uh, and uh, well, let me go to, uh, let me go to uh, Maluki uh, in, uh, in Kenya. You are yourself in the younger generation. You're a millennial. You involve more young people in farming because we know across the world the average age of farmers is over 60 years old um, so how do we get uh, young people younger generation involved thank you again Conrad I think that's a very fantastic question and, and to start us off I would like to also display a bit of a hub that I mostly use to train my family and people around me so that they get more interested in, in organic farming or even farming so my model is actually to just speak to people in the families, both in rural and urban areas, and try to show them uh, why it's important for them to also exercise sort of uh, farming systems and also just interact with soil, you know, to, to grow your crops. And what that has taught me is that uh, I think 
we need to change our families' perspectives. People don't farm because they don't know how to. People fail to farm or fail to show uh, interest in farming, maybe because they've not had that uh, experience with soils or with plants. So for me, I take that chance to try to uh, sort of lure my family to embrace farming. And so far it has gone so well for my mom and for my two brothers. It has also gone so well for my little niece who is almost two years. She's always speaking on my heart. And I think that's one of the best things that we can do to just transfer these experiences and to uh, increase uh, interest in farming. And further going on, I think it's important for us to engage the younger generation because the number one thing and fact that we cannot escape is that young people are, as of today, comprising over half of the global population. So we can either take this as a chance to uh, project the next uh, food security measures that the world takes, or we can take it as a cast and always uh, depend on food aid and, and all that. But for me, I think the opportunity lies within our governments, within communities, and within the private sector to actually tap into the potential of young people because we find we, we, most of us young people are really we are energetic, we are passionate, we have the time, and we need uh, the space to explore our skills and, and you know build our skill sets. Yeah, and, and, and being on the farm, I think it's one of the best ways that we can show young farmers how to be cool while farming and still you know uh, stand out, you know. And, and for me, I think that's one thing that stands out, and uh, most young people deserve this sort of. Uh, uh, thought going forward. I like the idea of cool. Earlier in our previous panel, and we must make farming cool. And in that way, we will also cool the earth by being cool farmers. I think we can make a hashtag out of that one. Yep. Um, okay, I'm going to ask Laureen a related question. And then after that, I would like us to actually go live on Slido and see what is coming in from people live and just pick the questions from there. Uh, really um, interact with our audience that are out there. Laureen, earlier when we were chatting a day or so ago, you, you were saying something about YPAD, and I wanted you to just pick up on that. Uh, what is YPAD, and how does, that inter how does that bring young people into the area? Specifically, uh, the organic one. Hi, Laureen. Uh, you are muted. Okay. I'm going to. Ah, yeah. oh, there we go. Yeah. Um, okay. So. Um, yeah. Um, okay. So YPAD is um, it's a member network, uh, and it's across. So you have members in Africa, you have members in Asia, you have members in Europe, and all these are young people who are involved in agriculture. So they, it's a mixture of uh, young people who are farming, um, young people who are in tech young people who are processors. Uh, and, and so you find that young people are more or less involved. Um, oh, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Uh, okay, so, yeah. So you find, um, you find this amazing knowledge base of young people who are involved everywhere along the value chain. Um, because I guess in the past we always thought farming involves uh, you know, being on the farm and, and doing all the hard work. But the way young people are coming into the sector now is through other avenues. So, you know, having them building apps so they can help farmers to, let's say, uh, get their food from the farm to the market, uh, building apps so that a farmer can identify uh, a, a pest for their tomatoes and how they can treat that pest. Um, so YPAD really, um, it's, uh, it's a good network, it's a good knowledge base. for anyone who's really involved um, in agriculture. Great, thanks, uh, thanks, Lorena. We, we're getting a few uh, dropouts, it seems, a bit of uh, lag in connectivity. Uh, just bear with us, uh, you know, it goes through waves. Uh, the internet has this amazing way of going through fast and slow waves. I don't understand or pretend to understand it. Um, yes, okay, what I would like us to do, and this will be uh, interesting, is really to go to the... Are popping. And as they pop up, we all three of us, you can jump in 
and you can you will now see it in screen sharing uh, uh, my uh, my guys have just uh, put it up there we go we have the top questions uh, from around from brazil from ghana from germany um and there we are with the first question that the, the top voted one at the moment young people from small farmers families are seeking to study and work in the cities how to keep the generations in the field um, who would like to pick up on that one first okay um i can i can try and answer and maybe mm -hmm. yeah um so in our case for how do we get young people so young people from small uh, farmers families uh, who want to study and then so i guess that is young people who came from a background of family farming and now have kind of abandoned it to go to the city um what we are doing at our farm is we are turning our farm into um, a bit of a learning a learning a learning uh, center i suppose um so we have young people who can come uh, back to our farm and they can you know spend time on the farm they can learn about permaculture they can learn about waste management um, and if they want to then go on and do something within urban urban agriculture in the city then they can also we can try and support them to do that so i think farming doesn't necessarily have to be in the rural areas we have more and more young people now who are farming in urban areas as well um, using you know limited land and limited resources, but they're still trying to do that in the city. So, um, so I think for us to be able to keep young generations in the field, it's uh, we can break this myth of farming has to be rural. Farming is now urban. Uh, farming is you know it's soilless, it's uh, it's hydroponics, it's 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 aquaponics, it's everything. Um, and I, I guess once we can break what it means to you know to farm, then more and more young people can come on board um, and do that as well. Great. I think I want to take it over to Kenya and, uh, and ask uh, Kaluki about this as well. Uh, you being a young urban farmer and working, uh, working in that environment, how do you see that? And then maybe Bob pick up on the same or any of the other questions that you feel you would like to answer that you can see on the screen. But um, Kaluki, just uh, following mm -hmm. on with uh, what Loreen said. Definitely, yes. Uh, just to add to what Lauren says, I think it's also important for us to recognize that times are changing and they're actually changing fast. And, and we find most of the modern education usually takes place in, in urban centers. So that's how you get uh, some of the best universities and all that. So I think on the one side, it's important to, for us to allow these young people to also move to the cities to access and acquire this education. But I think that young people owe it to the world and they deserve to think about where do we go and exercise or practice this knowledge that we got in the urban centers? And that is where I, I want to share my story with them that for me, I started Green Treasures Farms uh, in 2014. And back then I was still a second year in my university. And the reason I did this is because, well, I had already practiced so much uh, internships with companies, and I really wanted something better for myself. I mean, how best to do this if not going to nature? So that is sort of what uh, made me go back to my rural area and pursue green trust as farms. <coughs> and I think uh, if we can make young people also see, like I said previously, how cool farming can be, then it could be a good incentive for them to join farming. And the other thing, I think it's important for us to also encourage the intergenerational dialogues. For instance, most young people don't want to do the farming because it's, uh, uh, it looks too tedious or, I mean, from the older generation's perspectives, I mean, it's too mechanical. But with the knowledge that we acquire in the universities, we can go back to our rural areas, get some of the traditional knowledge from our elders and from our older farmer communities in our, in our societies, and then incorporate that with the uh, new knowledge acquired in our studies and now implement in our own uh, perspectives. Uh, and, and I draw the example of Green Treasures Farms, where we have a demonstration farm, uh, where actually farmers, both young family farmers and community have come and exchange ideas, learn from us, and also have that sort of uh, exchange amongst their farms. And that way you actually make farming cool, you make farming inclusive, and you make it so much more to want to learn from each other. I mean, we are a social species, and that is what farmers, farmers should also be informing from from a perspective of a young farmer. Thank you.
this uh, sort of, of us being social species and at the moment we have all the social distancing, but we are we, we cutting across that by uh, interacting with people from around the world and interacting across the continents, even if we uh, uh, are doing it virtually. Bob, any thoughts from your side on that or any of these other questions that you see here displayed well, that you would like to tackle? All right, well, good. One thing that we <laughs> see in our area, especially with average size, which our farm is an average size farm or smaller farms, the um, the father, in the case, who was running it in most cases, or the parents, uh, discouraged their children from even thinking about coming back to the farm, saying there was no future in, in, in these smaller or average size or medium farms. And I think what we really have a great opportunity to, to share with people um, that they don't have to farm in the old, well, the, the old chemical way, but they can increase the value of what they grow or add um, enterprises to their farm to make higher value crops that uh, families can be supported by. And one thing we try to do, I, I made a, a movie about um, what we've done in our farm with all kinds of other enterprises. And I knew we only had a few more minutes, so I just, I wrote a book and that's about our stories about um, experimenting and, and adding um, enterprises to the farm. So that there's lots of things that can be done. And just by going organic, uh, we are into markets uh, that are three or four times more profitable than the uh, commodity um, chemical markets. And, and if we could encourage people to look at the opportunities and then provide them with um, examples of how to convert and uh, support when they're trying to convert, I think we could have a lot more interest in uh, converting to organic and having uh, the children and the, and, the, and the younger people seriously consider coming back to their farms or going into agriculture, even if they don't have a family farm. Thanks, Bob. Yes, uh, I'm, I'm in the sense that, you know, we, uh, to me, it's got to do with the system. It's got to do with a systematic approach. It's this narrow view that what we're doing is farming. And that means, uh, you know, being somewhere in the soil, digging away and trying to uh, coax something out of the soil. But farming is part of a food system and we can all be part of an organic food system. And we can tap in on different places and different uh, entry points into the system. So it is, once we get away from this idea of simplifying farming into something that just happens in a specific place, done by specific people, I think that starts making a very, very big difference. There's... Um, so we have another 10 minutes. Um, we're having a really great conversation here. Uh, if you look at this, uh, there, there's a question here about digital technologies. I would like to pick up on that one. Anybody wants to pick up and say, you know, how do we, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, how can digital uh, technologies support organic farming and are they suitable to organic farming principles? <laughs> Who wants I can to take that one. Yeah, Conrad, I can say a little bit of something about that. I, mm -hmm. I'm uh, sort of on the end of the, or the beginning of the technological um, uh, digital phase. I didn't really embrace it wholeheartedly, but um, I did install some satellite tracking on our tractors, and I found that I could really um, enable me to farm much better at night, uh, which we were forced to do sometimes, and we were under um, uh, extreme. Um, uh, time duress with storms coming and we had to get our crops in and that really helped a lot. Um, I, I don't think that uh, we should uh, trade technology for our own two eyes however and, and looking and seeing what's going on in our fields and, and, and thinking about it and getting ideas. I think we should um, use uh, digital technologies as a um, another tool uh, not a not a dominant tool, but another tool to help us farm better, but not be the uh, rely on it for as a, as a substitute for um, a good thinking and good um, uh, observation and and decision making on our farms. Great. Yes, I think it's uh, uh, again it's this uh, issue of balance. I think uh, uh, Kaluki wanted to say something. You want to to add to this talking about digital technologies in farming? Yep. Yes. Yes. Definitely. And maybe to add to. Bob's points. I think we should appreciate the fact that we are living in a digital era, and technology is really helping us some of uh, solve some of our uh, current global problems. And, and especially in in the farming sector, I think uh, there are new applications coming up to help farmers uh, track or know 
when a drought, you know, or famines are coming. And these are sort of some of these technologies that we must always incorporate and appreciate that they are there for us, even in the organic farming uh, uh, sector. Number two, I think we also have new softwares. Uh, and you know, in my case, I talk about Trigger platform, which, which is actually funded by the UN and FAO. And what this does is that Trigger connects uh, farmers to buyers so you as a rural farmer, I mean, for my case in Kenya, I don't have to be worried about uh, if I have a bamba harvest, how do I get this to the market? This particular trigger platform gives me that kind of uh, 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 opportunity to market my products and tell them when they'll be ready for harvest. And then uh, trigger people will come and pick my produce and go and sell it at the market price. So number one, it eliminates the middle people and then on the other side, it gives me some very nice uh, uh, income, which is good for the farmer and profitable to the whole livelihood uh, situation. Also, I think it's good for us to leverage on online platforms to create uh, farmers' engagement and also create platforms for on online uh, organic farmers' market. And this way, we can then keep the conversation going and you know ensure that technology is working for us and not against us in the in the food security sectors. Great, thanks for that. Okay, I am going to go back to some of the questions here. This will be our last round of questions and then we will wrap up. I think I and Melissa was asking, uh, what barriers are the two young farmers facing when it comes to farming in Uganda or Kenya? And how are they overcoming these challenges? I'm going to take this to Bob too, because uh, even in the US, there are major barriers to entry. But uh, yeah, um, really quickly from you, what were the barriers and how did you overcome them? <coughs> Laureen, maybe you can start. Okay. Yes, you are, you are live. Okay. Um, I think one of the, the biggest barriers for not just young farmers, but farmers in general, is access to market. Um, that is a really big problem. Um, and I believe that access to market, the problem also comes about because there's a disconnect between the consumer and the farmer. Um, I feel that consumers and farmers uh, are not kind of talking to one another because we still do not know, there's no transparency in our food systems. So one of the big problems is accessing the market. When you have the produce, but getting it to the final consumer, uh, and I guess like Paul mentioned, the middleman, the middleman is the way for the consumer to access food. But once the consumer comes back, once the consumer now makes this connection back to the farmer and they buy directly from the farmer, then I believe that will more or less solve our problem of access to markets because then you know who you're getting your food from. Uh, and this transparency then also helps for you to know, is my food organic? Uh, what did the farmer use on their farm? What did they spray? What did they not spray? So you can have all these questions answered. Uh, and, and for as long as we have transparency, for as long as we have this, um, this understanding of, of our markets, of where our food comes from, I believe that will remove some of the barriers uh, for accessing markets for young farmers and farmers in general. Great, thanks, uh, Laureen. Yes. Connecting people, connecting farmers to markets, but connecting farmers to consumers and creating, uh, uh, and here again is where technology and uh, digital, the digital age can really, really help us. I'm going to take this, this question for a few uh, more thoughts from uh, Maluki, and then I'm going to go to Bob for one more question, and we're going to wrap up. Uh, yes. Thank you. Um, and just for viewers, let me remind you that my real names are Kaluki. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I understand. So, of course, like, like uh, it was mentioned by Lorraine, uh, one of the issues is actually access to the markets and, and the financial uh, segments to it. Of course, it comes from the point of investments. At times as a young farmer, you might not be privileged to have the uh, starting capital, you know? And, and so it also becomes a bit of a challenge as you try to crowd, uh, crowdsource and also get together resources to set up your, your uh, farm going. The other challenge uh, will of course be around land. Uh, that at times it comes from families that, uh, you know, they've occupied pretty much most of the land 
And so getting some ample land, piece of land to conduct or uh, carry out farming becomes a problem. And for me, I think that's what made me want to work more with other farmers as opposed to making everything under our family the farmland. So this way you kind of go above those challenges. And the final one, I think also then trying to balance because I'm not 100% a farmer, I'm also a professional on other sides. So that sort of finding a balance, I think for young people becomes a challenge, but then that's why you need to, of course, work with a support system. In this case, uh, other farmers and family that can really come in handy and help you uh, navigate through the whole uh, situation. Thanks, Kaluki, uh, and my apologies for, I also made typos on my... Of course. <laughs> This is again proof that we are live. Um, yep. Okay. Uh, I want to go back to um, uh, to Bob. There was one question uh, here from Anne in uh, in Germany, uh, asking how organic farming is more profitable, and uh, uh, how did you start in the market thirty years ago? Well, this is probably a half an hour story, but uh, I would like you to just <laughs> just pick up on this a little bit. You know, how is, how are you seeing it as being more profitable? And then after that, I will give you each. Uh, a uh, short space of time to make a final uh, share a final thought with us before we close. Well, thank you, Conrad. Well, first of all, um, we were able to reduce our inputs by about three quarters. Um, one of the reasons uh, farmers, particularly in America, are going broke uh, so quickly these days is because of the high cost of inputs and the amount of inputs we're told we have to have for chemical uh, farming. Uh, when we reduce our input costs by three quarters by substituting all the chemicals that we used to buy and put on our farm by raising our own fertilizer with using legumes that we worked into the ground, um, uh, that was an enormous advantage of reducing costs. And then we were able to find markets that were willing to pay two or three times the uh, market price for commodities for actual organic grains. And that's where I started. I, I um, uh, started going to food shows and uh, looking for markets. I, for one farm, you don't need too many markets to get started. And we, we were very fortunate to find some bakeries that were looking for high quality wheat in the beginning. And that's, and that's what we started with, just a couple bakeries. And uh, we built upon that. Um, I, I, I didn't have a lot of money to go out and create a, a market, so we just did a lot of um, networking with friends and with um, word of mouth, and that's the way we were able to build it, just kind of brick by brick. And um, now, 30 years later, it's a, it's a much different situation, and the market has uh, much more opportunities. But um, we, didn't, uh, we didn't give up, and we just kept going, and we adapted to the changing market, and we kept building upon the experiences and the um, opportunities that we had saw, we, we saw coming. Great, thank you so much. What I'm going to do now is the last round is just think about this uh, carefully. There was one question here and maybe I'll use that question uh, for us as a final thought. Literally one sentence each on this question. How can the younger generations convince the old boomers uh, <laughs> myself in this broader perspective of you convince the older generation to shift. Uh, Kaluki, do you have do you have an idea on how we can do this? I certainly do. And and I just let people know I'm an activist <laughs> in my other world. <laughs> so I would like to tell the older generation that I think we deserve a system change. We deserve to move away from a capitalistic sort of a system that has obviously told us that profit is more important than systems, it's more important than nature, and it's more important than, than communities. So we need to rethink our systems, and we need to learn from COVID-19 that we are nothing without nature. We are nothing without nature. And again, we are what we eat. So if we can embrace organic farming within our reach, then we are definitely teaching the older generation that, you know what, we got it covered, and you either join us or we just let you go and continue doing it. But I hope that everyone can join us and we can learn from each other, just like here we read the intergenerational conversation, which is so important for us. Perfect, thank you so much. And uh, Laureen, uh, last thought from you. 
Um, last thought, well, um, with regards to that question, I feel it's the other way around. I feel um, it's the older generation that needs to convince the, young, the younger generation to return to our old ways of farming. That's what we need. I mean, we were farming organically before. We were doing it right before. And it's only with, you know, with the change of the world that we've now reverted to different ways of farming. But I feel that the current generation ought to learn from the older generation. We ought to go back to how we did farm before. Uh, and then we can avoid everything. You know, we can avoid. Uh, so we need to learn a lot from, from Bob. Um, we need to learn a lot, you know, from, from the, the people in Latin America who are farming organically, like they were farming before, their, you know, older generations. Um, and I guess if I could uh, perhaps close off with one sentence, just to urge people to, um, to think global and act local, uh, because for, if we can do that, that will completely change our food systems and how we source and consume our food. Brilliant. Thank you so much. And uh, last word, last word to Bob before I close the session. Bob, <laughs> over to you. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I'd say there's two ways to do this. First of all, is to buy more organic. Um, let, the, let the customers, let the, um, the shoppers tell the older generation and all the, all the farmers that, that the demand in the future is with organic. It's in America the only uh, segment of agriculture that's growing. And the more we support that, the more people start to um, seriously consider it. Um, I've had uh, more calls from older farmers, probably of my age, in the last um, 18 to 24 months than I had in the last 30 years, asking me about ideas of converting to organic because what they see is this thing we call conventional. This isn't conventional at all. What we've been doing <clears throat> in agriculture for the last 10,000 years, that's conventional, just like Lorraine was saying. Um, what we've been doing the last 70 years is a huge chemical agricultural experiment. And we're seeing that the wheels are coming off that bus, that um, uh, agricultural technical chemical bus. Uh, we have all kinds of pollution problems. We have uh, weeds resistant to herbicides. We have farmers that are going broke because they can't afford these inputs. We have um, health problems. We have pollution problems. So we can see that we're really going in the wrong direction. And I think the sooner that everybody appreciates that and are given opportunity and information of how to change, they will begin to change. Change will come, whether through disaster or design, the change yes. will come and it's up to us to decide. And I want to thank you all for that. Thank you so much, I think it was really great. Uh, we responded to some of the questions we got on Slido, but I'm glad that we could go there and uh, see what people are thinking and feeling. And please continue to feedback on Slido. So thanks to all of you, Bob, Kaluki, uh, Laureen. Uh, thank you for your input. Uh, we will keep contact. Uh, we'll keep on uh, sharing and we'll keep on uh, maybe answering more questions offline and through our blog and through uh, Facebook. Uh, so uh, keep on with the conversation. Um, we are moving into well. Um, I would like to, I'm just looking at my screen here, we're going to have a video uh, now. Another video as a transition will give us a chance to grab a cup of coffee. I think I need one. I'm sure many of you do too. Uh, we need some coffee need a break and then there's a video about uh we unite thank you i can't find my place on it's so good to have it there's actually a team behind here and they wave at me and they show me things uh, and that really <laughs> that really keeps me going the video is called we unite it is a 14 minute video uh, two organic farmers who drive their tractors into the center of berlin to demonstrate and campaign for a better uh, food and farming system for all. And while you watch the video, post comments, go on Twitter. Uh, and after the video, we will be uh, back with our final panel talking about uh, um, food without farmers. Enjoy the video.
so wie wir Landwirte. Ich heiße Hanna Erz. Wir sind hier in Brandenburg, im östlichen Brandenburg, also im ganz östlichen Teil von Deutschland. Wir sind hier auf dem, auf dem Standort seit 2016. Wir haben diesen Betrieb hier gekauft. Wir halten Legehennen. Die Eier verkaufen wir komplett ab Hof. Dann bauen wir eben noch Gemüse, wie jetzt Kürbisse an, dann Kartoffeln und dann halten wir eben noch die zwei Kühe. Ich bin in einem Dorf aufgewachsen, wo es im Nachbardorf eben viele Landwirte gab und ich fand es irgendwie faszinierend. Damals war es aber schon ein bisschen unüblich, dass den Beruf Frauen ergreifen. Habe aber dann auch mit der Zeit Frauen kennengelernt, die eben auch den Beruf zur Landwirtin gemacht hatten und habe mich deswegen auch entschlossen, dass ich den Beruf zur Landwirtin machen möchte. Ökolandbau funktioniert in meinen Augen nur als geschlossener Organismus. Und wir haben halt Kleegräser bzw. Wiesen, deren Aufwuchs äh, weder wir Menschen direkt essen könnten, noch Schweine oder Geflügel. Insofern brauchen wir dringend Wiederkäuer wie Rinder oder Schafe oder Pferde, die sozusagen dieses Gras und diese Silage verwerten und daraus dann Mist machen, den wir dann gezielt zu den Kulturen auf die Ackerflächen bringen können, wo dieser Mist dann gebraucht wird. Wir ernähren Bakterien, auf dass die Bakterien die Pflanzen ernähren, die Pflanzen die Tiere und dann geht das Ganze wieder zurück. Wir haben jetzt einfach auch gemerkt, wenn wir ökologisch arbeiten, dass wenn wir längerfristig gut mit unserem Boden umgehen, dass dann die Erträge auch jetzt nicht deswegen schlecht sind, sondern ich glaube, das können, können wir auch andere ökologisch wirtschaftende Betriebe eben bestätigen, dass die Erträge eben auch im Ökolandbau sehr gut sein können. Ob der Klimawandel nun menschengemacht ist oder nicht, hatten wir im vorletzten Jahr eine Sintflut und im letzten Jahr eine Dürre. Und weil wir den Betrieb bewirtschaften, wie wir es tun, haben wir überhaupt was geerntet, während die konventionellen Betriebe um uns rum in der Trockenheit verdorrt sind. Nach meinem Eindruck spielen Landwirte sowohl in Deutschland als auch weltweit eine immer geringere Rolle. 
Und das spiegelt auch die Zahlen wieder. Wir haben allein in den letzten zehn Jahren 25 Prozent aller europäischen Landwirtschaftsbetriebe verloren. Und je weniger Landwirte es gibt, desto weniger werden Landwirte natürlich auch wahrgenommen. Wenn es nur noch einen Landwirtschaftsbetrieb in fünf oder zehn Orten gibt, dann sehen die einzelnen Leute den, den Landwirt nur noch auf dem Traktor vorbeifahren. Aber es ist keine Interaktion, demzufolge verliert die Bevölkerung natürlich auch den Kontakt zur Landwirtschaft. Draußen, wie im letzten Jahr, die größte Dürre herrscht, aber man in den Laden geht und man bekommt problemlos Milch und all die Produkte, dann hat man natürlich als Verbraucher auch nicht den Eindruck, als wenn Landwirtschaft eine Rolle spielen würde. Weil es ist ja immer alles da. Und deshalb ist es so unheimlich wichtig, dass Bauern Zugang zu Land haben. Und wir diesen weltweiten Konzentrationsprozessen, die gerade im Gange sind, dass immer weniger große Betriebe immer mehr Fläche bewirtschaften, dass wir den Einhalt gebieten. Also man muss sich das einfach vorstellen, wir sind jetzt hier 20 Jahre am Kämpfen. Alles, was drei Generationen erwirtschaftet haben, steckt in diesem Hof drin. Wenn wir diesen Hof verlieren, verlieren wir alles, was wir jemals besessen haben. Ich habe keinen B-Plan, ich weiß nicht wohin. Also bei der Demo sind wir quasi seit der ersten Veranstaltung mit dabei. Und jedes Mal, jedes Jahr erneut wieder mit neuer Begeisterung, weil sich dann eine, eine immer größere Massenbewegung daraus entwickelt hat. Erst waren es sozusagen nur die Landwirte, die auf ihre Misere hingewiesen haben. Mittlerweile strömen unendliche andere Organisationen zusammen, die das alles von unterschiedlichen Blickwinkeln betrachten, aber trotzdem in die gleiche Richtung marschieren. Mich ermutigt es einfach, dass so viele Landwirte eben nach Berlin kommen und dann mit ihren Traktoren fahren, um sich eben für eine bessere Landwirtschaft in Deutschland einzusetzen. Wir sind ja hier nur stellvertretend für viele, viele tausend Betriebe, denen es nicht anders geht. Wir sind nur eine der wenigen, die den Mund aufmachen und in die Öffentlichkeit gehen und über ihr Schicksal berichten. Der Druck auf die Landwirtschaft und dieses ganze ausbeuterische Landwirtschaftssystem mittlerweile einfach so groß ist, dass die Leute die Systemfrage stellen und einfach sagen, wollen wir wirklich so weitermachen? Nein. Ja, und mit Hilfe des Ökolandbaus und diverser anderen Richtungen kann man auch zeigen, wie es denn anders gehen könnte. Ich glaube, das ist der Fokus der Landwirtschaft der Zukunft. Es geht nicht mehr darum, die Bevölkerung satt zu machen. Es geht nicht mehr darum, Masse zu produzieren. Sondern es geht ganz klar darum, dass öffentliches Geld auch für öffentliche Leistungen ausgegeben wird. Und genau das ist der Punkt. Artenschutz, Klimaschutz, auch dass es allen Beteiligten in dem System gut geht. Also ich denke, Verbraucher können Landwirte am besten unterstützen, indem sie eben direkt beim Landwirt einkaufen. Wir haben eine immer aufgeklärtere Verbraucherschaft und die gibt mir wahnsinnig viel Hoffnung. Es ist seit langer, langer Zeit nie so viel über Lebensmittel diskutiert worden und wie sie entstehen. Und wir haben gerade in der Jugend einen ganz großen Shift weg von Fett und Zucker und Masse hin zu Bio, lokal, regional, äh, gesunde Ernährung. Und das gibt mir unheimlich viel Hoffnung für die Zukunft. Wir Landwirte, 
müssen uns zusammentun mit all den Menschen, die mit uns gemeinsam aufstehen für unseren Zugang zu Land, gutem Essen, faire Preise und damit eine bessere Zukunft für uns alle. We are back with you. I hope you enjoyed the short film. Um, and now I would like to just quickly pop into the slider room again, see what is happening there um, uh, before I close it and move. Uh, obviously, we have a lot of farmers or would be farmers or urban farmers online because if you look at how many people are growing food at home, 56 percent of our responders say yes and the other 28 says they would love, love to and only 16 percent says no okay well that's cool that's a very positive vibe we want to get a few more of the people saying no so we can convince you to say yes uh, so please <laughs> tell us uh, if you are aha suddenly some uh, little bit of an update happening live as we are uh, streaming in so yes uh, that's slido we will continue on slido we will also for the next panel on Slido. Um, and we would also like to close room two now and ask you to move to room three in Slido uh, because that's the room for our last conversation of the day. And there's a word cloud there that we would like you to, uh, to think about how you see the future of food. And um, uh, yeah, and then uh, post your questions and remember to tweet. Remember to connect, uh, to connect and communicate. We, uh, we would love to hear from you. Um, some of you might have joined us later in the session, and uh, I would like to invite again, before we go to the last panel, uh, Louisa Lutikolt, uh, just to talk again about iFarm Organics International, what we do, why we do it, and why we are collaborating with the Global Landscapes Forum on this event. Louise, are you there? I'm here. Thank you so much, Conrad, for this opportunity. Um, so IFOM, Organics International, is the global agent of change for true sustainability in agriculture, value chains and consumption in line with the principles of organic agriculture. And so we are an association and we work with and also on behalf of our members. And there are about 800 organizations in over 120 countries worldwide. And all these organizations have in common that they subscribe to the principles of organic agriculture, which is the principle of uh, health, ecology, fairness and care. And we heard about that earlier this afternoon or today. And what we want is that more farmers practice organic agriculture and similar approaches like agroecology, and also that more consumers have the opportunity to eat healthy, nutritious organic food. We also want that organic agriculture in itself can be better so that we can increase the contribution to the sustainable development goals and our common goods. And with doing so, we also want to inspire the rest of agriculture, those farmers who are not or not yet organic, uh, so that they can also take on practices and uh, principles of organic agriculture to be more sustainable in the end. 
And so what we do is we provide capacity and leadership development. We provide accurate communication and also campaigning to multipliers like our Honest Food campaign. And very important is also that we advocate and provide competence for a favorable policy environment for organic. And uh, if we talk about policies, we think they should include the true societal cost of actually the public baths that the externalities of chemical industrial agriculture represent. So we're very happy to work now with the Global Landscapes Forum because their current theme on food and livelihoods directly relate to our work to promote organic agriculture. And we know from experience and also from scientific studies that uh, practicing agroecological and organic agriculture actually positively contributes to the livelihood of farmers and the majority of them are smallholders. And maybe when preparing for this uh, session today, I was thinking about that we could also have a notion of livelihood of landscapes or maybe even foodscapes. Because as long as we know people have related to their natural environment, we are part of it for our very survival. And many landscapes have functioned as foodscapes for this purpose. But actually, currently, we're on a dangerous path. Uh, we don't no longer uh, respect the interrelation between livelihoods of both humans and landscapes. So the Global Landscapes Forum, therefore, rightly puts the focus on how to survive in the Anthropocene. And we, from IFARM Organics International, are convinced that such survival is possible only in relation and in interrelation with our agroecological landscapes and by respecting planetary boundaries. Thank you, Conrad. Back to you. Thank you, Louise. Uh, thanks for the message and thanks for putting us back into the context of what we are doing here today. We're nearly ready for our final panel discussion for the day. Um, before we do that, just want to pop into Slido, uh, see what is happening there, and remind you once again tweet, hashtag eat honest. Um, uh, talk to us, tell us what's happening. The future in 20 years time of food, organic, yep, healthy, fair, local. I think that's a very interesting topic when we start looking at these things, lo being locavores, um, being sustainable, fair, organic locavores, uh, a lot of adjectives to describe our food systems and it's constantly updating. Biodiversity, I think, is one that should maybe up a bit and regenerative. These things are a very important part of what we do, but local seems to be uh, important to you guys out there. Uh, keep on tweeting, keep on sharing your thoughts, and uh, in Slido Room 3, uh, when we move on now, you can post your questions to our panel. Um, we will use it during the discussion. We'll also harvest your questions from there, and. Um, we uh, will try and answer as many as we can through our other media over the, last, uh, over the next number of days. Our final panel discussion today is about food without farmers. Is this the future we want? This is the question that we're posing. And uh, I'm very happy to hand over to uh, Dr. Peter Menang, who will moderate the session. Unfortunately, at the moment, we seem to have a problem with Peter's um, camera. But Peter is live, he is uh, audible, and uh, he will moderate the session. Uh, Dr. Menang leads the landscape's governance theme and is the global coordinator of the ASB Partnership for the Tropical Forest Margins at the World Agroforestry Center. And he has more than 20 years' experience working on climate change, forestry, and landscapes in Africa, Latin America, and Asia. And I'm very, very Happy to welcome him to uh, moderate our session with a really great group of panelists. Over to you, Peter. Hi, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. I'm sure we're watching from everywhere around the world. I think we have about 300 people online now. Um, our panelists are from, you know, speaking from the UK, from the US. Uh, from Sweden, from Chad, from Nairobi as well. So, so it's quite a global audience. Um, I'll, I, without wasting time, I think to discuss this very exciting topic for today, 
uh, food without farmers. This is the future we want. We've got really very good panelists to, to talk about this with you today. I'll just run through quickly just to introduce the panelists to you very quickly, um, and then we'll get into the substance. First, we have George Monbiot, who is a, a, an author. He's a columnist with The Guardian and also an environmental campaigner. Um, he's very well known. Uh, um, I know quite a lot of his work as well. Um, George really, really is a really good, good, good person. He's worked a lot on, on natural climate solutions and he even co-presented with Greta um, uh, on, on some of his TED Talks. And, and his TED Talks actually attract 40 million views at a time, 50 million views. So that's quite... Uh, so we really hope to, to get uh, some good value from him today. Uh, our second speaker will be Gunnar, uh, Mr. Gunnar uh, Rundgren. Uh, Gunnar has worked most parts of his organic uh, farm sector globally, uh, working from farm to policy over 50 years now. Um, he's been a consultant for the United Nations, uh, for the World Bank, and for various big development organizations. Uh, he became a board member of IFAM in 1998 and, and has since then, you know, worked a lot on this subject. He's, he's honorary, you know, doctorate in, in, in quite a number of, of uh, uh, um, institutions. So he's going to talk to us today quite, quite uh, uh, detailly about this from, from a, an organic farming sector perspective. Our third speaker would be uh, Mrs. Hindu Umaru Ibrahim from Chad. Uh, Hindu is very well known in the climate sector. She's been, uh, she's an environmental activist and from Chad and she works basically uh, with pastoral communities looking at indigenous rights and environmental protection, in, in, mainly in Chad, but across Africa. She leads, as uh, she founded, and is leading the Association for Indigenous Women and Peoples of Chad, AFPAT, uh, and has been engaged in, in, in global campaigning for indigenous communities, and was recognized recently with the Pritzker Emerging Environmental Genius Award. So we, we, we've got, um, as our fourth speaker, um, Dr. Walter Willett, um, Walter is a professor of epidemiology and nutrition at Harvard uh, University, uh, the, the uh, Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health, and has been a professor at the Harvard Medical School for quite a number of years. He's even been dean of uh, chair of the Department of Nutrition for more than 25 years. He's very well published. Uh, and, and just to let you know, he's, he's also among the top three most cited persons in all areas of science. That's quite, quite phenomenal, with about 1,900 peer-reviewed articles. And he's also a member of the National Academy of Science in, in the U.S. Um, our last speaker would be uh, Mrs. Julia Lenout. Uh, he, she's worked as a data information manager of the Research Institute for Organic Agriculture. Uh, up until 2019. And Julia is quite well known for leading um, quite some important work in the organic uh, agriculture sector. She's led the annual report, the World, the World of Organic Agriculture, that has been published quite uh, uh, um, well and well known. And she's also led and produced the State of Sustainable Markets report uh, in partnership with uh, uh, the International Trade Center and the States of Sustainable Initiatives. She, she grows you know, her own family farm and work for six years at the family company. Um, she's also been a board member of uh, a farm uh, since 2017. So we've got a really, really great panel today. Um, and I'm really grateful that they, are, they took the time and, and they're present here. To, to talk to us. So we'll, we'll go through our panelists. Um, each one of them would have about four minutes to, to, to talk a little bit about this topic. Uh, and we'll start with George. So George, with uh, your tremendous experience uh, and, and your passion for this whole subject of uh, 
uh, growing, you know, food in, in the lab. Um, I'd like to know from you what is lab-grown food, and the audience might want to look at how does such a vision contribute to low carbon economy uh, and help us stay within planetary boundaries, and who owns the technology at the moment. Thank you very much, Peter, and thank you everyone for listening. Uh, I've become interested in this subject of lab-grown food for two reasons. One, because of the tremendous damage done to the world's living systems by principally the livestock industry with its massive use of land, very often land which could otherwise be um, harboring tremendous ecosystems and fantastic wildlife and defending indigenous people. Um, and secondly, because an increasing number of scientific papers now are suggesting that somewhere between 2 and 3.5 degrees of global heating, basically we lose the ability to feed ourselves. Um, farming collapses in several parts of the world. We could be faced with um, a global systemic harvest failure, um, a, a synchronous harvest failure in several of the world's major breadbasket regions some of which could start shifting towards dust bowls. And we are in very, very serious trouble indeed, unimaginably serious trouble if that happens. I mean, we've been seeing people recently fighting over toilet paper in the supermarkets. I hope we never have to see people fighting over food, but unless there's a really dramatic shift and we see fossil fuels left in the ground, then that's a very real prospect. And I had very few people are really getting to grips with that. So rather reluctantly, for those two reasons, I've begun to take an interest in lab-grown food, particularly in microbial protein, um, where protein can produce, be produced very quickly and efficiently from soil bacteria with minimal inputs. And that protein can then be used potentially as building blocks for all sorts of other foods. Um, it could be a feedstock for cultured meat and milk, for example, for cultured fish, taking massive pressure, potentially off fisheries. It could be an ingredient in all sorts of other foods. Um, I see it both as a way of potentially replacing um, some of the meat products which we use with such devastating effect at the moment, uh, ecological effect, and as an insurance policy to develop in case we do fail to get a grip with climate breakdown and we do face structural global famine if we rely entirely on farmed products under those circumstances. There are big problems with it and I think the biggest problem is intellectual property which could potentially allow a few corporations to really corner the market in what might turn out to be an absolutely crucial food place, uh, food stuff. And we should all be getting in at the beginning now working very hard to ensure that doesn't happen and to ensure that if these things are developed, which I believe they should be, it should be done um, on the basis of open source platforms, open source um, material, op open source um, uh, 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 te techniques and technologies. Uh, because what we do not want to see is this becoming a new frontier for corporate co concentration and control of the food chain. Okay, thanks. Thanks a lot for your very, very brief uh, uh, and insightful, insightful uh, uh, talk. I, I really enjoyed it. I think there was quite some salient points, points in there for us to to take forward in in the in the discussion that comes after this. Um, Guna, um, I'm, I'm sure you're ready to 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 talk to us. Is there a way in which farmers can adjust and adapt to climate change, or will they really face this future? Um, how are global market shaping demands and farming? And how do you have any uh, 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 ways in which we can we can try and 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 and, and reduce reduce this impact for them? Well, let me start with the later part of it. Uh, mm -hmm. good, morning. good afternoon, everybody. By the way, <laughs> uh, I think I start with the market perspective because overall. By and large, the markets are very important in today's world. Uh, in fact, I think we already know how to farm sustainably, and I think we know how to eat healthy. The problem, is, in my perspective, is not really lack of uh, technology or even lack of information. I think we perfectly know what to do. 
uh, but it's simply not profitable, it's simply not doable within the economic framework we have constructed. If you look at the problems, the ills of the food system, animal factory farming, endless monocultures, all the chemicals used, the dramatic loss of biodiversity, obesity, malnutrition, food waste, bad working conditions, and threatened livelihoods for small farmers and pastoralists, I think they all come together by being driven by the same force, the global market economy or capitalism, call it what you like. I mean, take it for example, food waste. I mean, we are morally condemning consumers because they waste food, but why are they wasting food? Why do they buy more than they need? The market economy has basically transformed food into a commodity, into a product whose main purpose is to be bought and sold. And the role of the consumer in this system is basically to buy. They buy too much food, they eat too much food, they eat the wrong kind of food, food with cheap calories, which are produced by giant corporations. And in the end, they throw away a, a big share of the food they buy, which is totally coherent with the logic of the market. It's the same with clothes or anything else. We are over consuming because the market wants us to buy more and more. And if you go on the farmer's side, the problems with industrial farming are all triggered, I would say, by the market economy. Animals and plants are just commodities to be sold in competition with millions of other producers doing exactly the same thing. The economies of scale drive farmers into linear, linear industrial production systems, building on buying mostly imports, inputs instead of relying on the local ecosystems. And specialization and mechanization go hand in hand with this. And the end result is what we have, so to say. And I think we need to challenge that system rather than to look into technological fixes. Of course, there will always be technological development and we also within the organic and sustainable agriculture, we can improve, we can do research. But basically, I think we, we already know how to farm and eat sustainably. Thank you. Oh, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, uh, uh, Gunnar. I think that, that a very interesting discussions and I see there's a thread almost emerging already from the first two, two talks, but we'll, we'll, we'll leave that for the, the questioning session. Um, let's go to Hindu. Um, Hindu, um, good to have you here as well. How can we protect food sovereignty for indigenous people and other vulnerable groups under such scenarios in the long run? Um, is there a way to combine traditional knowledge with technological advancement? Some of the things Guna talked about, can we bring that into the indigenous setting. Thank you very much, Peter, and uh, good afternoon to everyone. I hope that in this moment, all of you and your families doing well. And uh, it's so hard, and we are seeing how food is very important, particularly in this time. And food sovereignty become a big challenge actually now, because when they close all the border, the lockdown, everyone, but they let the food shipping to be open. And this is around all the continent and all the countries, they took this decision in the natural way. So that's make our discussion very uh, valuable because what is the food sovereignty of each state, each nation, but each community. So that's what indigenous peoples do because when we talk about food sovereignty, we always talk uh, about us, about how we produce in our community, but how we respect the food that we eat and how culturally it's representing us. That can come from the farmers, from pastoralists, from the fishermen and from the hunter gatherers that depend from the food and the brood. So in indigenous peoples way, we always have the land who is the most important for us. So that's why we, we are just like laughing where the international community is started by organic food, calling the organic food. We say like we already eating organic and we already growing organic because we use our traditional knowledge to make the balance in our soil, to fertilize it in the natural way. And one of the examples I can share with you as a cattle herders coming from Embororo pastoralist. 
So why we continuously doing our nomadic way of life? Because when we move one place to another one, our cow sheep become a natural fertilizer to the land. So it can help growing the pastures. It can help also the farmers now with the climate change impact to come and sit in this land to grow up them food. So when you use like the chemical and when you use the natural fertilizer, you know exactly it is different because we are seeing that the people that using chemicals, they change the farm maximum in five years. And that's exactly what's happening in all of all over part of Africa. And as coming from the Sahel, I know how the food security impacting the peoples, but I know also how indigenous peoples are doing the best to know when they have to plant them seeds. And that's linking directly to our knowledge. So we do have a traditional knowledge based on astrology. So there are a number of the stars that can be positions who can announce the coming rain season. And when those stars are not well fixed with our atmosphere and the moon positions, even there is a first and second rain, you can't plant your crop. You have to wait. And sometimes even there is no rain, but this position is just to link it in a right way, you can plant your crops and that help you to get the food that you want for your community. But of course, climate change impacting a lot what is happening. It's changing a lot our way of production and of consumptions. But the most important is how we can use the, the knowledge of indigenous people who are very valuable with the technology that exists. And then I leave you with the second example that we do. So we do work with meteorological organization in indigenous communities. So we try to combine the two knowledge to give the better information on the weather forecast for indigenous communities. And that help not uh, just for like uh, one month, but it can give the information for three to 12 months to the farmers to say, okay, now you can harvest, now you can plant. So if we all come back to the food sovereignty of indigenous peoples, to the knowledge that we do have in our hand. We can produce better food and we can eat better food. And I think someone said very well, food waste, it's one thing, but we do not see the food waste in developing countries. Why? Because we do respect the food. When we start eating, we know that the food we have to give first to the children and then to all the peoples, and then the rest of the family can come and eat. When there is rest, we use this rest to eat it again. If we do not, we cannot eat it. So there are our cows who can eat them. There are the sheep who can eat them. There are the chicken who can eat them. We never throw the food in the garbage because just so we do have enough or we don't want to eat it. So if we do not respect the food culturally, spiritually we cannot have the enough food for ourselves and that needs to be a big transformation and transition from the lack of the food to the food sufficiency to the food sovereignty and to the okay mm. oh, okay thank thanks a lot thanks a lot hindu very interesting insights there um and we'll come back to those with the questioning thanks a lot thanks um let's go to walter um Walter, thanks for, for being here, um, and I'm sure we will, we will benefit from your, your, your talk at the moment. Well, I think what the audience might like to hear from you would be, how do you see a he healthy and sustainable diet in 20 years' time? Um, how do you see lab-grown food coming in, and, and how does farm-free uh, you know, food production benefit uh, the world, uh, the public, or do you see it like just a situation where multinationals will completely benefit? What is your take on that? Sure. Well, thank you, Peter, and thank uh, everyone for getting us together. This is really an amazing group of people with uh, incredible experience and perspectives, that, uh, and we need all of that because the future is, is so challenging. I, I think looking ahead 20 years, actually that's coming pretty quickly, uh, <laughs> I don't think the basic picture of a healthy and sustainable diet is gonna change radically. 
uh, during that time uh, for most people. Uh, and from lots of research, we understand that for it to be optimally healthy, it should be primarily plant-based, not entirely necessarily, but emphasizing vegetables, fruits, nuts, seeds, whole grains, and with optional and modest amounts of dairy, fish, poultry, uh, and, and other meats. Uh, the best studied example by far is the traditional Mediterranean diet, but we know we can put those kind of pieces together using the dietary traditions of pretty much the whole world, whether it be Africa, uh, Asia, Latin America, or elsewhere. Uh, uh, and I, I think in, in, uh, we, we do really need to make put that, those pieces together, like has been done in the Mediterranean diet tradition, in a way that is enjoyable, aspirational, and regarded as smart, because it is both healthy and environmentally sustainable and, and affordable. Um, so a, a lot of shifting our eating patterns has to be dealt with on, on the demand side. And unfortunately, as uh, Gunnar mentioned, there's a, there are economic reasons that have been a lot of the drivers to create the situation of terrible diets that we have now. Uh, it, it, it probably, uh, maybe not necessarily the worst, but in the U.S. now, obesity is up to 42%. And with the COVID epidemic, uh, the re main reason that people are getting seriously sick and, diet, and dying is because they're, they either have diabetes, obesity, hypertension, heart disease, which are really primarily conditions that are diet-driven. So that we, we know that people are dying early and because of those conditions. We've known that for a long time, but now it's just happening uh, in a dramatic way uh, before our eyes. Uh, I do think they'll, we'll see much more per variety in production systems, uh, including lab-grown meat and uh, uh, perhaps greenhouses in the desert situations where uh, uh, various types of protein foods are uh, produced uh, in an amazing ways that uh, they can be now, even uh, where you need very little water and just capturing the tremendous amount of solar energy that's coming down in those situations. And I would strongly encourage uh, research and development and creating as many options as we can because we don't totally understand the future. And, and I agree with George, we need all the options we can on the table. And we don't really know how what the optimal uh, set of uh, experiences, options will be given conditions that are changing very rapidly uh, before us. But I also agree with Hindu that we should first look to traditional knowledge and practices that have accumulated and been refined over thousands of years. And for a healthy dietary pattern for a culture, first look at the traditional culture and foods that are produced and consumed as a starting point. Uh, it's not always, from what we understand now, optimal. Uh, I could say that about the Northern European diet. It was a, a diet that people could subsist on in Northern Europe in harsh conditions, but not, but not the healthiest diet. It was really a heavily animal-based diet that we see clearly isn't the most healthy diet. Uh, there are some real advantages I can see from farm-free uh, uh, production of meat. Now, I don't think we need meat in high amounts, but if people want to have modest amounts, uh, that can be produced uh, without antibiotics, less disease transmission, potentially more efficient than the uh, kind of uh, industrial production of meat that we have now because that's just so inefficient, feeding grain to cattle and, uh, uh, and uh, such tremendous inefficiency in that system and a huge amount of greenhouse gas produced in the process. Uh, there's, a, I think, a growing uh, place for urban gardening. Uh, uh, and especially for p highly perishable foods like greens, uh, but we're not going to produce large amounts of, uh, of uh, grains and many other crops in urban areas. Uh, I already mentioned uh, possibly desert farming, uh, where we can uh, minimize the water that's needed and use maybe algal systems. Uh, more efficient greenhouses in colder climates uh, can uh, uh, clearly play a role. So I, I think there is a virtually everything we're producing, we can do better. And we need research on how to do that better, how to optimize every kind of production system. But I, I quite agree that uh, the way we're doing things now is mm -hmm. to a large extent driven by economic uh, conditions. And the mm -hmm. reason we have these vast monocultures in the whole Midwest, our family farm in Michigan, 
is basically vast monoculture corn. And that's what a farmer can survive doing now, given the economic uh, opportunities and, and pricing system. Mm -hmm. So we, we do really have to look carefully at the mix of uh, loans, subsidies, taxes. Uh, as uh, some people said earlier, what we're doing now does not really internalize the cost in terms of greenhouse gas production, pollution, uh, when we go to buy something that looks very okay. cheap in the store. Okay, thanks. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Walter. You want to wrap up or you have, you, you're done? That's it. Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot, Walter. Really, really good, really good points. We'll, we'll come back to those, I'm sure, and I'm sure people are, are asking questions. Please remember to type your questions on Slido as we go. So when we come back from Julia's intervention, then we can take take some questions. So Julia, thanks for your patience. Thank you for waiting. Um, now we would just like to hear from you. Uh, how might we equip farmers with the right skills and the right knowledge needed to farm sustainably? Um, previous speakers have spoken a bit about that. How, what, how, do, how, can you, how do you see that, uh, see us doing that and make sure that people are integrating the local traditions and, and what role for agroecological approaches such as organic, what, what does that, how does that play in? Well, first I would like to rethink the question. I think we keep on saying we need to train farmers. We mm -hmm. need to, like, we treat them like mm -hmm. child that need knowledge and they have vast knowledge. All, mm -hmm. as Hindu said, as Kuna said, knowledge is there. So we actually maybe should try to empower them. We should actually try to connect them to exchange, to bring the knowledge they have of their landscape, of their environment, of what grows there, how the climate behaves there, and actually try to diversify the systems we have. We have an homogenization of systems right now. We are trying to apply one diet, one system all across the world. And I think that's one of the main reasons that brought us to the crisis we have right now that we are eating five products all around the world that brings also obesity, that is not really giving the nutrients we need. Um, today I was in the early sessions and as Hindu said, now with this pandemic, we see all the roles, uh, the key players, what we need. And for example, here in Argentina, every day at nine, the whole country in the evening goes out to their balconies and clubs, doctors, policemen, etc., that help to run the country in the lockdown. But we forget to clap the farmers. The farmers are bringing our food. It's not only coming from a shelf, it's not coming really from a dispenser. There's farmers with knowledge, with work, and we should remember to clap for them as well. So for me, I can't conceive a future without farmers. I conceive rather a future where we are all farmers, where yeah, urban farming brings, comes more into play, where farmers are more empowered and recognized and not are seen as a shameful thing to, to do, where young people go more into farmers, where Aboriginal uh, knowledge is taken into account and really recognized as actual knowledge and technologies and ways to perceive and really understand the landscapes. Of course, as Kuna said, technology, the, the, the world moves. We should adopt certain technologies. We need to improve certain methodologies because we learn. With time, we learn. And we learn that maybe something we have been doing was not perfect. And there, we need to support farmers, definitely, because we have researchers focusing on certain issues and they develop knowledge and we need that connection. But that's why I would rephrase the question rather than mm -hmm. how we give them tools, how we support them, how actually we work all together in supporting each other and really engaging each other and recognizing the knowledge they already have and start to listen a bit more to them rather than to the big corporations that are running the industrial, the agro-industrial mm -hmm. system we have right now. Mm -hmm. Oh, great, great, Julia. I, I like that. I, I am very, 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 very happy with the rephrasing of the, of the question. I think that's absolutely the right perspective. We, um, I think we will now thank you so much, all of the panelists, for very brief but also exciting interventions. Let's see what people are saying. Let's hear what people are asking us. 
at the moment. Um, Niam, any specific questions? Um, hi, Peter. I would say that we um, take it from the top. We have a question there from the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. um, and I would ask any of the panelists who feel in a position to respond to please do so. Thank you. Hmm. Well, I'm, I'm happy to say something. Yes, please. Yeah. Go ahead from uh, Pim van der Horst. Yeah, well, I looked quite a lot on, on the um, lab foods and indoor farming. And uh, as a matter of fact, they, uh, there is a very delicate connection between energy, land and water, which people often lose. Uh, they're all interrelated. And in indoor farming, for instance, you actually replace land and water with energy. But you don't save land and you don't save energy. You use, just use energy, uh, land and water, which is somewhere else. As a matter of fact, the energy requirement for indoor farming is just horrendous. 1.5 square meters of indoor farming with your artificial light would per capita in the world will consume all the electricity we produce in the world currently. It's just utopian and with no sense of meaning to promote that as something relevant in a, in a food supply connection. It can be fun, it can be nice for a shop to have an indoor farm, like to have an indoor bakery or something like that, but it's just a, a techno gimmick. And I would say that the other lab foods I've looked into are in a similar way. They are wasting enormous quantities of energy. And then they say they save land, but they don't save land because energy need a lot of land, whether it's for solar panels, wind parks or, or mines for, uh, for nuclear power, not to speak about hydro dams where I live. We, uh, the area of hydro dams are double the uh, arable land in my country only the area of the of the hydro dam so we are so we are you using... wrap up wrap up the response so we well, can give a chance yeah, for the other well, questions. yeah yes yeah so i see these high-tech solutions are not very meaningful but would like to link in with hindu and julia that we are what we really need to re-embed food in the local context and local con conditions and local ecosystems and thereby we create also meaning with the food Instead of having it just as a, something you buy or sell, you re-embed it and give it meaning back to food because we need meaning also, not only n nutrients from food. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, Thank just, uh, okay. Thanks, thanks a lot, Guna. I'll, I'll go to, to uh, George. There, there was a question, an anonymous question. The second one was about, you know, um, um, it says a lab-grown food is controlled by global corporations using often GM resources and bacteria. Why should we embrace that kind of industrial food? If, if George can provide a response to that, and then yeah. I'll ask maybe Julia to think a little bit about why is the use of GMO banned from, agricult from organic agriculture, is, is, you know, and, and to take that question soon after that. And, and then maybe if, if uh, we can come back to, to, to the set of questions again. George, can you react briefly to that, to that question? Much. Thank you very much, Peter. Yes, well, there's all sorts of problems involved in it. And by far the biggest problem is this problem of corporate control and intellectual property. Mm. And that, I mean, my feeling is, you know, we don't throw out the technology because of the way it's currently controlled. We have to push for open source technology and take it out of the hands of the corporations. Now, I'd say that, you know, what, what Gunnar said, was absolutely correct when it comes to vertical farming of horticulture, for example, but I think he's mixing that up with microbial protein production, which is an entirely different matter, and whose energy and water use can be far, far smaller than those of conventional agriculture producing comparable products. He's mm -hmm. absolutely right that if you're trying to use vertical farming to produce vegetables, you're gonna use a lot of lighting, you're gonna use a lot of heating, there's going to be an awful lot of embodied energy there, but it can be a very different matter indeed when it comes to microbial protein production. These mm -hmm. are different technologies. We should assess them differently, and we should not mix up the technology with its misuse, its potential misuse by corporations. If this is a useful technology for humanity, we should make it work for humanity, 
And that means we should pursue open source, people owned technologies rather than corporate owned technologies. Mm. Okay, Th thanks a lot, George. Thanks. Julia, can you take that? And then maybe Walter, you can, if you have some thoughts relating to that, and also um, um, uh, the, the other question linking global systems to local systems, that would be helpful. So after Julia, then you can come through. Julia, sorry. Yeah. Thank you. And actually, I wanted to build on George. I think okay. the basis of GMO, of genetically modified organisms, is that humans, we jump on new technologies and we get so excited and then we spread it all around the world without really knowing long-term effects. We don't know how it, that means to the soils, what it means to our health, to biodiversity, etc. In organic, it's clearly we don't accept GMOs. GMOs, well, they have a currently the most used that, for example, in Argentina, we are one of the biggest GMO consumer countries with soy, BT soy that has already pesticides inside the sea. So that's a no-go for us. But we also are seeing that it's not delivering on what it promised. The soils are getting more, uh, uh, more erosion, the productivity gets lower, so you need more inputs. It's not actually feeding people, it's feeding maybe livestock or going to biofuel. So when we think about technologies, I think we should embrace technologies, but we need to think on the long-term effect. We need to try them, we need to test them, not to be so enthusiastic and go and spread it all around because they have impacts. And we are seeing it with GMOs, they haven't delivered. We still have hunger and it's not a matter of production, it's a matter of distribution, it's a matter of priorities. So um, it's not that we are against technology, we are against modifying genetically the organisms. We are doing it by breeding, that is a completely different technique done in a lab and also well we have the issue of ownership and patents and the fights of seed sovereignty that farmers can save their own seeds well there are bigger issues why inorganic we don't accept it okay good thanks um walter any thoughts about those two questions I, I... Uh, yes um just an absolute we... sharp set of rules and that I think, like Julia said, uh, we shouldn't totally take GMOs off the table if there are some very careful, thoughtful, smart ways to, say, have some crops that be, might be more drought resistant in a situation where conventional crops are, are failing. Uh, so, uh, and uh, George is right, they have to be more open access. Unfortunately, the GMO technology has been more used for profit rather than for helping people have sustainable, healthy diets up to this point in time. But it doesn't mean that they can't be useful, very carefully thought out in some situations. It, and it is important to keep in mind that uh, it, it, it's just a technology and a way of moving faster uh, compared to conventional breeding, where we've changed the nature of crops sometimes by conventional means, sometimes in bad ways as well, where we just bred for yield rather than nutrition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Valid points there. Um, Hindu, can, can you just talk a little bit? Because in your presentation, you talked about um, where people were using chemicals and, and more modern ways of farming, and then they have to sort of change and move to another place because the soil is destroyed. And the, you know, so how do you see that integration between the global and the, and the local food systems? Yeah. I I think, I mean, as uh, Julia said, it is a matter of priorities. So if you do your own priority, you can develop your economy in a different way. So it's not uh, just like uh, to choose a big farm is better and then you can put chemicals and you can fertilize the land forever. That cannot work like that. It is how they can respect and recognize the small holder farmers because those smallholder farmers are the one who are feeding the world for a century with a diversity of the food. And we know from the example of indigenous peoples in Peru from the different kind of corn that they have, more than 800 corn that they do have. 
it is the same in each indigenous communities. And now, mm. just so when we move to the chemical, we try to select the seed and we say this seed is much resistant and it's become a globalization for all. At the end of the day, with all the climate impact, the biodiversity loss, the soil mm. change, we cannot get this in a right way. So we need just to re reconvert and respect the stockholder farmers to encourage the young generations. When you value the farmers and you value the food system, so the young generation cannot move from what they do, they can go back and do the farms in a very right way. And when you do not grab the land from the smallholder farmers to be to do a big farms by using a lot of energy and a lot of water that you cannot control, so you cannot mm -hmm. work it well. So that is the mm -hmm. most important mm -hmm. part that we have to do to preserve mm -hmm. the soil and have a sustainable agriculture. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you. Really, really great, great thoughts there. Um, Niam, can we go back to Slido, please? So we can see if there are some more interesting questions that we can take. Um, um how can we make sure that lab grown food is sufficiently nutritious always doubt whether we have we plants what they need to become nutritious so there is so much still to discover about this um i think um maybe how is organic farming facing serious work shortage worker shortage i think we can we can take um the question on on uh, making lab grown food sufficiently nutritious and whether we know enough about that, and how can we call a factory um, down a factory vertical farm hydroponics still a farm? You know, um, I think those two relating to technologies more, and then and then one said more about uh, worker shortages uh, and things like that. So I don't know if anyone wants to respond to some of those. Um, Peter, I could um, pick up. The yes, please, George. Yeah. yeah, yeah, George. Yeah. Um, so the question, the answer is that actually we don't know much about mm -hmm. the nutrition issues at the moment. Not as much as we ought to know. Mm -hmm. um, there's still a lot of work needs to be done. Um, mm -hmm. We need to find out why it is that processed foods are often so harmful to human health, and whether we can avoid those harms if we are to mm -hmm. produce lab-grown foods. Mm -hmm. which of course will require a degree of processing um, and indeed are themselves the products of processing. Um, that there's still a lot of questions here. I think mm -hmm. you know, I want to bring it back really to the, the original point I was making that you know one of the main reasons for looking into this is I think we urgently need an insurance policy and it mm -hmm. might not be a perfect insurance policy and it might mm -hmm. not be a perfect mm -hmm. substitute for what we've got but I, I feel there's a danger that this discussion is sort of drifting into a state saying, well, this is the ideal we want, this is how we want it, and we can move things in this direction. You say, well, if we get two or three degrees of global heating, which we're highly likely to get, unless we see a very major change, those dreams just go. They just burst like a bubble because huge areas of the world become unfarmable by whatever means. You know, and you can come up with fantastic ideas for farming, but they're not going to work if it's too hot to be outside, if the thermal tolerances of the plants are exceeded, if the livestock die as a result of heat stress. There's a whole load of reasons why it just becomes impossible to farm beyond a certain degree of heat. And mm. so we desperately need to be putting big resources into investigating questions like this. You know, what is the nutritional implication of lab-grown food? Um, can we do it without it falling into corporate hands? Can we do it safely? What are the energy implications, etc.? We need to, you know, we must never close our minds to these questions. They are absolutely crucial. They could be crucial for human survival. And, and please, let's be as open as we can and let's see some serious research money going into these crucial questions. Um, Walter, how much, how much do you think is going into understanding all of these issues at the moment? Well, I, I, I quite agree with George uh, that not much is going into understanding all of these issues and we really should be investing in broadly in agriculture, including some of these sort of more novel directions. 
as well. And uh, people have pointed out that in some places, insects might be a way to much more efficiently produce food than certainly fasting more efficient than uh, feeding grain to cattle. Uh, so I think we do need to look uh, carefully at the nutritional aspects uh, and uh, that's both, we can do nutritional analyses pretty quickly and simply and get some rough first approximations about the nutritional value, but we also need long-term studies as well because we don't totally understand all of the implications for cancer and heart disease uh, just by doing short-term studies. So this isn't, a, I, I quite agree, we really have to, broaden our thinking and look at many alternatives uh, because we are coming to some extreme stresses. And uh, part of it is we're adding 250 or 2.5 billion people that we want to feed and we're not feeding the people that we have now anywhere close to healthy and sustainable diets. So, uh, and, and also again, uh, for, there's no one solution for every context around the world. Uh, the contexts are extremely different. And, we need a, a good long menu of different options, I think, for different mm -hmm. uh, regions mm -hmm. to find what works best for them. Mm -hmm. Gunnar, I mean, you, you're wanting to comment, I can see. Um, can you also just refer to, there's a question from um, someone from Romania asking if, if uh, what do you think would be most impactful in terms of challenging the current system? also okay. as well as you comment on, on. well I, I hope I, I get time yes well uh, well I don't I don't disagree that there can be a need to do research in new ways of producing food but I do have a, a problem with a, with a narrative of you know starvation etc we've seen that before it was the same in 1960s and the end result of that debate in 1960s we have now is the green revolution it's the giant monocultures that walter speaks about they are a direct result of of uh, the narrative going on in the 1960s which led to more irrigation more chemical fertilizers etc and we actually have an enormous oversupply of agriculture crops today which in turn is driving the uh, the livestock industry, especially chicken and pork production, is actually driven by the monocultures that you see in the Midwest or in, in, the, in Mato Grosso or other areas in the world where you have transformed whole landscape into producing just one or a few crops. That is really driving the, the uh, livestock industry, the animal farming industry, the factory farms. And, and, but in essence, we have a huge oversupply of agriculture products, which is a problem for farmers, I would say, <laughs> especially for small farmers, because the prices are depressed in a way where you can't uh, survive on, on small scale farming. Even traditional farmers like herders are losing out because people buy cheap chicken instead of uh, buying grazed Cattle, cattle, so to say. So I think we should not, I mean, we are, I am also concerned about climate change, but I'm quite convinced that we have enough capacity to produce good food for the people of the world today. And I'm quite sure we will have that also within 20 years and 30 years. I'm less sure about 100 years. We'll see about that. And the other question, what I think is the major the option to change is actually to relocalize food systems more and more and embed them in the local cultures because that's also how you make resilient systems which is very uh, well highlighted today with the, all the impacts of the corona crisis that we need much more resilient food systems and the only way to get that is actually to re-embed food in the local ecosystems and in the local cultures and, and adapt the local diet again to what you can produce locally instead of buying food from all the world, eating the same sushi or uh, wheat loaf all over the world. So that's my input to what we need to do. Thank you. Just to respond, do you think Guna, from a developing country perspective, we have all the technology uh, the way Guna says it and um, to, to feed the countries as well? Hindu, please. Yeah, actually, um, uh, uh, I agree with what George said. Uh, if the world's going very warm, we cannot get the food that we want. So it's mm. very important to know that now, I mean, even yesterday in the TV, I was seeing that they are saying uh, people in Africa will be more than 50 million by the end of the year will be faced the food insecurity. 
So always it is like the same discourse, but the numbers are changing and increasing every day. So rather than changing the discussion on, oh, Africa, you are going to face the food insecurity, why they cannot say like, oh, we need to tackle climate change and limit the, the greenhouse gases? So by the next 10 years, if we didn't take a right decisions on how we can be in 1.5 or maybe 2 degree, so we can have any kind of agriculture, it's not going to be happening in developing countries. So that's the thing, it's not having a technology with a big farms that they want to transform Africa and feed people of Africa. No, we need to stop climate change, restore our biodiversity, we do have our knowledge, and support the smallholder farmers, and then the food insecurity can be fast without climate change tackle without the SDGs reached I think the food security will be a big challenge not only for Africa but for all the rest of the world Julia any quick comments for like 30 seconds from your side yeah. just Thank on you. the discussion please yeah yeah very very quick I fully yeah. agree we have climate crisis is not climate change is climate crisis climate change is already here and I think farming is a way to tackle it. Farming, doing it properly, adapting to the local conditions, really storing carbon in the soil, really restoring ecosystems is a way to tackle climate change. So we should see also farming as part of the solution to not reach those five degrees. Uh, grassing is also part of the solution. Cattle is also part of the solution, but it depends where we do it. So really adapt systems mm -hmm. to the local situations. Mm -hmm. So I understand mm -hmm. the apocalyptic view of short. I share it. I'm also afraid and I also agree we need to explore and have plan B, C and D, but we mm -hmm. should act now. And act mm -hmm. now means invest in small farmers, invest in organic agriculture, invest in regenerative agriculture, invest in biodiversity protection, invest now. I think I protect mm. our indigenous community, our small farmers, I think now. Okay, I think that, that's a very good, that's a very good wrap up statement from your end. Can we go through the panelists? Just 30 seconds, please. What is your last take home message? And we can start with Julia. 30 seconds, what is your last take home message from this discussion? One let's sentence act, would be nice. Let's act now. It's okay. now the moment. Okay, uh, Walter? I would like to also emphasize what we eat as well as how we produce it because the, the pro, uh, we are an attractive, really very destructive outcome in terms of our global environment. Uh, and part of the problem is the huge consumption of red meat uh, uh, in U.S. and increasing now up with China is up equal to the U.S. and the rest of the world is going down that same track too. And uh, we are uh, uh, just multiplying the adverse consequences that we're, we're seeing. Uh, so part of uh, the important point is to shift uh, more or in many cases just maintain diets that are healthy and sustainable. Uh, rather than pursuing the track that we're on in terms of what we eat as well as how we produce it. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Hindu, any last, any last word here? It is our choice all to respect the knowledge of indigenous peoples, the land, the farmers recognize, and we do have all the tools. So let us act together and act now. Okay. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Uh, Guna? Guna, can you on me? Yes, I, yes. yes. Uh, well, I, I, I like to promote the idea of a landscape model for food uh, instead of a plate model or, or pyramid or whatever models <laughs> you have. We should reconnect food and people with the landscape where they live. So a landscape model of food which builds on what is there around us uh, should be a, a desirable outcome, I would say, on how you can link food and farming, which also have a lot of social uh, perspectives. Thank you. No, oh, okay, thanks, interesting. George, any last take, 30 seconds? Well, thank you everyone for a really fascinating and important discussion. Um, the key issue for me is we face the greatest predicament humankind has ever faced, which is the gathering collapse of our life support systems, including our farming support systems, which is the entire natural world. 
Um, obviously, we have to do everything we possibly can in our power to prevent that collapse from happening. We need to be throwing everything there is in it. We can see with the pandemic that governments are prepared to act, but let's act on climate breakdown. Let's stop that from happening. But at the same time, let's ensure ourselves against the possibility that it does happen, and I'm afraid that is a very strong possibility indeed, by keeping a very open mind about where our food might be coming from. Hmm. Thanks a lot, George. Thanks. Really, really useful point. I think we've got a, quite a good uh, and in, an interesting set of messages today. I think um, coming out that we need to go back to our traditional food systems to look at ecosystem-based food, the sort of landscape approach to, to this, I think is a really useful point. I think we've come up with the discussion that lab-grown food is part of the bigger set of options that we need to think about, but think about every technology in a very specific way, but look at how do we manage that for the good of mankind and, and for, in a sustainable way. Um, um, and, 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 but also the, the corporate discussion was quite important here, looking at how do we take corporate, how do we take this technology out of the hands of corporates to take it away from profit to more open source and for uh, uh, better use, uh, you know, by people. I think the call to action now, I think is important. There was an important point about looking at instruments that we can use to address the current market asymmetries at the moment that are not favoring healthy and nutritious diets. I think Walter made that point with changing our incentive infrastructure in terms of loans, taxes, and subsidies that sort of help the market. But I think overall, act now, look at all the options, go back to the more you know, uh, uh, ecosystem-based and more healthy options. I hope that sort of captures in, I mean, the essence of our, of our discussions. Otherwise, thank you very much. I don't know if Conrad wants to close up, but I think George, uh, Gunnar, Hindu, Walter, Julia, thank you so much. It's been, it's been phenomenal, exceptional. We've had more than 1 million people connected. So that's, that's really great. And the messaging has been going across. Thanks a lot. Bye, Thank everyone. You. Thank you for a Bye. great job. Thanks. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Conrad, do you want to take yes. over? Thank Happy you so much. See you in real person sometime. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. I also want to say thank you to everybody. I want to say thank you to Peter. Thanks for moderating. Uh, it was a fascinating discussion. Thanks to everybody in the, in the panel. Uh, it was a great, uh, great discussion, great debate. Uh, some big topics coming out here. You know, we're talking, we're really talking about our collective future and how we're going to try and, and come up with solutions and come up with them very, very quickly. I'm sitting here in Bonn in a, what is promising or threatening to be the next a uh, serious drought in Germany in uh, less than three years, uh, two of them already in the last three years, uh, Africa to, uh, to Bonn. And I thought I was leaving dust bowls and drought behind when I left, uh, when I came to uh, Europe. And uh, clearly it has followed me here. And I think this is really part of what we have to um, accept. So thanks for that. I would like to make a quick turn back to our interaction, go back to Slido and see what we have there. What, what are the last few thoughts that came through? Um, what are the key takeaways from this forum? Uh, thank you, things are happening. Yes, things are happening and they have, have to happen very, very quickly. Through, I don't know if there are other uh, takeaways coming through from there. Uh, there were some uh, building bridges between food communities, AIDS, economies, and ecologies. Yep. Uh, good thoughts. Uh, you know, we had a lot of questions that we just unfortunately could not get to. Uh, really good questions. Uh, some challenging questions in that group uh, asking, you know, how does the organic sector join this move? How do we become part of the act? activist move, uh, how do we bring these issues of climate change and agriculture together? Um, the issues that we have there that uh, uh, we have to deal with. And we will pick up on some of these questions. We will take them back into our fora and we will try and, and, and answer and keep the debate going. Uh, and that's really where I would like to uh, um, uh, start closing us up.
uh, I would like to invite you to visit our blog. Um, Organic Without Boundaries is our blog. Uh, you can reach it through our website. And on the blog, we tackle a number of these issues. We have uh, you talk to us, uh, bring it in. Food is complicated, says somebody. Save the soil. Yep. Uh, I don't think food is that complicated. I think it's uh, people who are complicated. Uh, we're making it more complicated than it. it's complex, yes, but it is great. So with that, I really want to start uh, saying goodbye. We've had a long day together. I would like to thank everyone for making this possible. We had a team of people right around the world working all the way from Indonesia to Bonn uh, to the Americas. Uh, thank you for everybody, the panelists and moderators, especially for your contribution. Really, the whole thing from Mix International and GLF behind the scenes. And until we meet again, be well, be safe, stay healthy, and stay connected. Um, social distancing doesn't mean that we cannot be close in our hearts and in our minds. Be blessed and goodbye.